No, I guess now I feel like, oh, no, it's too late. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. We are both broadcasting in the room and on the phone to those zooming in with us. I'm Kim McCoy Wade, the California Department of Aging, and so sorry to break up all the wonderful conversations happening, but very happy to welcome you to something new and different and vital, which is the first equity work group of the Master Plan for Aging. Uh, so welcome, all of you, here in person and uh, remotely. Um, we have such an exciting uh, agenda today, um, and, but let's first find out who's here in the room and who's here with us. Um, and then I'll make comments. Let's do that. Carmen. My name is uh, Carmen Gibbs. I'm with the California Department of Aging. Host facilitator, happy to be here. I'm Carmen Lisa Trishy, and I'm retired. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this, this plan is for me. So. <laughs> and uh, I was last with AFP National Office in Washington. And I'm Rigo Saborio, and I'm with St. Barnabas Senior Services, a uh, 100-year-old organization in uh, Los Angeles, and happy to be part of this uh, work group. Uh, I'm Kevin Prineville, uh, Executive Director of Justice and Aging, and uh, I also feel like I work for Kim these days. <laughs> um, Don't we all. <laughs> I'm a member of the Master Plan for Aging Stakeholder Advisory Committee, along with Rigo. And also with Rigo uh, and Carmelita, a co-facilitator for, for our group here. And Marty Lynch, a uh, member of the SAC, uh, recently retired. I'm a emeritus CEO now, by the way. <laughs> oh, oh get my congratulations. Uh, uh, lifelong medical care of Federal Qualified Health Center. Founded by the Great Panthers. So, uh, and I definitely work for Kim. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, Catherine Blakemore. I'm representing Disability Rights California. I'm a member of the Stakeholder Advisory Committee, the LTSS, I guess we're a subcommittee or a subcommittee, one of the required ones, and on the Equity Committee. And there was some email asking me to be on something else, but we <laughs> <laughs> finished first. I'm going to be ignoring it. Derek Lamb, President and CEO of the I'm the Director of Diversity and Inclusion. Um, thank you. Is it on? Um, we'll work. Okay, and uh, I should mention I also serve on California AARP's Executive Council. I am. Oh, oh. <laughs> Sorry about that. Well, actually, can we take a Who do we miss? We met, especially our new members, this is our first meeting. We have uh, many SAC members here, Rigo Saborio, Kevin Prindeville, Marty Lynch, Catherine Blakemore, and Derek Lamb, but I want to make a really warm welcome to folks who this is their first master plan. So, can, Kiara, can you introduce yourself again, please, so everyone on the phone can hear you as well? I'm Kiara Harris. Thank you. I'm co-founder of Sisters Aging with Grace and Elegance. We promote healthy aging for black women in particular and women of color in general. Thank you. And Edie, one more time. Thank you. Sure. I'm Edie Yale. I'm the Director of Diversity and Inclusion at the Alzheimer's Association, and I also serve on California AARP's Executive Council. Hi, I'm Marcy Edelman, and um, I'm on the California Commission on Aging, and I also serve on the Governor's Task, Alzheimer's Task Force, and I'm the founder of Open House at, uh, at uh, Affordable Senior Housing, welcoming to the LGBT community in San Francisco, as well as serving the broader community with uh, health and social programs. Good afternoon, I'm Betsy Butler, and I am the chair of the California Commission on Aging, because it's sounding weird to you as it does to me. Um, I'm also the executive director of the California Women's Law Center. We um, focus on domestic violence and pay inequity and those kinds of items. Um, our tagline is pursuing justice for women and girls, so at this stage in um, our nation's history, there's a lot of work to do. I also sit on the Los Angeles Probation Commission. Hello, I'm Lisa Sainz. I'm a 
Chairman, Special Advisor to AARP California, <clears throat> a member of the California Commission on Aging, and a steering, committer, steering committee member for <clears throat> the Coalition for Asset Building California, which focuses its attention on low-income folks, including seniors, and a member of the LGBT community. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Jeffrey Reynolds. I'm the Executive Director for the Latino Coalition for Healthy California. We're a statewide policy advocacy organization representing our largest racial ethnic community here in the state. And I'm also here representing my parents uh, who are immigrants and just retired, and my older brother who is a person with disabilities. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Berenice Nunez Constant uh, with Altamed. I uh, serve as the Vice President of Government Relations with Altamed. I'm also a stakeholder advisory committee member. Um, and I'm also the policy chair for Latino Coalition for Healthy California. Hi, Donna Benton with the University of Southern California. I'm with the Stakeholder Advisory Committee. I'm also representing the Association of Caregiver Research Centers and um, a member of the Diversity and Inclusion Committee within our association. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sylvia Austerlick. I'm an intercultural facilitator at the Pensante Connection. And I'm, I'm also here, also, I worked for 10 years for Houses of San County, providing direct services by going back to the Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Linda Canaris with the California Pan Ethnic Health Network. Uh, we are a statewide health advocacy organization um, that strives to reduce disparities across racial and ethnic groups um, and improve health outcomes um, across the board. So, yeah, excited to be here and work on, on all of these, of these priorities. Good afternoon, Dr. Leandra Sarkarvi. I'm the Director of Policy and Legislative Affairs at the California Council of Community Behavioral Health Organizations, Council. Uh, we represent mental health and substance use disorder clinics across the state, also a board member of the American Psychological Association. I'm Ellen Goodwin with the CDA staff, and the Wi-Fi password I've written on the board back there. Oh, it, 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 there's a guest so Wi-Fi, and it says, you can barely read it, it's sunshine at 1300. Well, now you're giving it away. I'm just kidding. Is there a username? Is there a username? MPA. I will find out. So, uh, MPA. Okay, MPA. Thank you. Yes, thank you for... Um, uh, one of the things you'll learn is that CDA is a work in progress, and we are modernizing to Wi-Fi is new here. We're oh. very excited. So wow. maybe the first meeting here with Wi-Fi, yeah. So bear with us. As all things, we're learning new things. Um, Maria, and can you help us with who's on the phone from the uh, committee? Um, we've got uh, Karen Lincoln on the line. Okay. Um, Lydia Mitsuidis, who's on the LPS. Presenter. Yeah. Can Karen go ahead and introduce herself? Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, this is Karen Lincoln. I'm a, an associate professor at the University of Southern California, founder and director of Advocates for African American Elders, and I'm also a member of the research subcommittee. Hi, hi, this is Valentine Villa. I'm a professor of social work at Cal State Los Angeles. I'm also an adjunct professor of public health at UCLA and director of the Applied Gerontology Institute. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Well, I think that means we have everybody except for one of our new members, Cheryl Brown, with us. So thank you so much for uh, making the time to be here, either in person or with technology. Uh, one thing we wanted to update before we turn to the purpose uh, is that, uh, first of all, thank you for applying. I'll put a quick timeline. Thank you for telling us about your background in equity and aging uh, and uh, accepting the challenge of uh, coming to work for a few months to help us get this essential document right. I did want people to know that when the staff members who were forming the group uh, looked at our pool, we wanted to go back for some even more diversity in two areas, and particularly around tribal representation and disability representation. So we got another 35 applications that we are looking at, uh, and just um, in coming days, we'll be making another set of offers to a few more people to uh, make sure we bring our best to the equity for all in our body itself. So. I'm sorry we couldn't get that second round completed by today, but we will be in the continuous improvement mode and adding really important voices to our table. So you'll see some new names soon. We're deeply in the meeting logistics, but there you have it. Welcome to CDA. Um, 
And do people, I'm not the one to do it, do people know the bathrooms and know the emergency exits and have what they need to feel safe and productive? And those on the phone are raising their hands as needed and you've got them? Okay, well this is our Zoom technology that we learned from the uh, California Federation of Independent Living Centers to allow for participation, so thank you. Okay, so what are we doing today? We're going to do a lot, so thank you for coming and being ready to work. We're going to start with a, a discussion of, of the why, the purpose of this new group, uh, and, and have a good conversation about that. Then we want to ground people in the master plan for aging. Some of you have a lot of that from the SAC, and some of you that will be new, and so we want to make sure we have a common understanding of the master plan for aging, uh, why, what, how, when. Um, then we're going to really hand it over to our facilitation team, uh, Rigo and Kevin, who are two members from the SAC who uh, volunteered to be co uh, co-facilitators, and, and a new member here, Carmelita, who is not on the SAC but was selected for the equity work group and suggested as a, as a co-facilitator as well. And they all agreed to do it if the other person would do it, so thank you. <laughs> so they're going to lead us in a uh, ec uh, talk about equity generally, um, and then what that would mean to apply and to begin to develop an equity tool and begin to apply it in reviewing the MPA deliverables, uh, and we're going to try to practice with the very first MPA uh, Master Plan for Aging, stop me if I go into acronym speak, uh, the first Master Plan for Aging Deliverable, which is a stakeholder report on long-term services and support. So we're going to practice some things today. We'll take a break. We believe in breaks. Um, and then, just, then having done that first exercise, we want to come back together and plan the next few months. Um, now that we have a sense of some of the deliverables that are coming, how our process works, how we're going to go back and inform the full stakeholder advisory committee, how long do we want to meet, what's our cadence, what's our uh, location, what's our um, half day, whole day, all those good things. Um, so we'll spend some time organizing ourselves. We always have public comment at uh, meetings, and then we try to wrap up uh, both the summary and action steps. We also want to create some space for closing reflections since uh, uh, we really do think this is an important moment in the history of CDA, uh, the beginning of much more work to do in partnership with all of you. So I'm really excited to see what comes and also uh, humble about how much we're going to learn along the process. So uh, please invite you and thank you in advance for helping us continually improve and get it right. Uh, with that, we have been borrowing from our friends at AARP. I'm surprised how many of you have an AARP affiliation in this. I shouldn't be surprised, but um, given our leadership on aging and, of course, equity. But these are the meeting guidelines they have at their tabletops at their office in downtown Sacramento, if you've ever been to their boardroom. Uh, start and end about time. We almost did that. We had we lots of catching up to do. One person at a time. Try to be fully present. Use respectful language and tone and assume good intentions. Any comments or questions? Okay. Why are we here? What's the purpose? I'm going to give a little background and then uh, let my colleague Carmen Gibbs talk us through. Um, we are here at the, at the very beginning because our governor has a vision of California for all that is deeply embedded and woven through everything that he and, and his administration uh, is about. So California for all is the big vision. And when the master plan for aging was, cre uh, was ordered, it was through an executive order in June, and it very much uh, is intended to be a master plan for all of us, for all families, all communities, all, all people. And so when the master plan for aging stakeholder advisory group, the 34 names that were named began meeting in September, it was um, the group said, we need to be clear about our vision and our values. We get our mission from the executive order. We have, we have our marching orders, and I'll talk more about that, but what's our vision and our values? And equity was right at the top. And we spent a lot of time talking, not a lot of time, we spent good time talking about and defining equity uh, from many different um, perspectives, race, ethnicity, immigration status, language, gender, income, LGBTQ+, plus, uh, disability, ability, um, rural, urban, many, 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 many lenses on equity. So that got us going. And then as we kind of started to turn, get into the work more and more, there was a, a, a proposal from the SAC, from Kevin and Rigo, at our December meeting, that we needed to not just have a value, but to have a process and have a structure to make it real. Uh, and uh, Kevin, I won't try to speak for you, but you, you said a comment, often equity comes in at the very beginning and the very end. And uh, how do we put equity all the way through, and this was their great idea, that we have an equity work group. Uh, so the board uh, December meeting said that's a great idea, and Betsy in public comment said it's a really great idea, so thank you for that, uh, Betsy. Um, and here, and we were off and running in January, uh, accepting applications, and then here we are in February with our first meeting. So that's 
the short um, history of the equity work group. And Rigo and Kevin and Carmen and Carmelita have been spending some time on the next slide, which is what is our purpose? What is our purpose? This is this is the why. Um, we all know that we're, what we're doing is extremely important here. Um, but let's let's put some grounding on, on it a little bit. So this is the purpose that um, we have developed. The purpose of the equity work group is to apply an equity lens to development, implementation, and evaluation stages of a master plan for aging. The work group includes MPA stakeholder advisory committee members, MPA subcommittee members, and community members. Its task is to thoughtfully consider the perspective of groups that have been historically underrepresented. The equity work group will advise the MPA stakeholder advisory committee to ensure resulting work products acknowledged by it can actively identify and address resulting disparities. So we definitely wanted to make sure that we were comprehensive, that this is not going to be, like Kim was saying, a beginning and end. This is going to be interwoven throughout the MPA process. And our facilitators will walk us through that. Um, and then I know you have some um, slides about just going into California aging and why. Let's pause here, though. Let's pause here to look at the language, sit with people, and see if you all want to say more at this point or. So do you have it up on the <laughs> this is the problem with co-facilitation. <laughs> <laughs> so again, I think it's just, this is Rigo Sabora, Environment Senior Services, but uh, um, I, I think just to re, to reiterate, this is you know equity is something that transcends everything, right? And so uh, and uh, as was stated, it, it, it oftentimes you know groups go through these processes and they go through the process and come up with the end result in a product. And then it's only afterwards that they think about, you know, communities that have been underrepresented over time. And so and then coming to think about within the product, how do you add that uh, into that equation? And it's something that we certainly, and that we're trying to reflect for this purpose in our work is that this is something that we're going to do right from the very beginning, and inequity is going to transcend everything that we do. So that's why in that purpose it says that we're going to apply the equity lens to the development, implementation, and the evaluation target stages of the master plan. So it's from the beginning, middle, and the end. And, and so um, eventually we're going to go through some exercises also that help us get on that same page so that together we can achieve that end. Yeah, and I would just add as some context setting at the start that, as Kim outlined, there's a tremendous amount of work being done on this master plan in a really short period of time. So even as we were conceptualizing this work group, there was some tension between wanting to get it really right, you know, wanting to take something as important as equity and make sure that we were getting the purpose just right and the group just right. Uh, so, so that intent, as well as needing to do this quickly, so we may not have everything, you know, this meeting, we're admitting we don't have everything planned out perfectly, uh, but we're uh, lucky to have you here to collaborate with us to build it. So when we put up a slide like purpose here and ask you to react to it, we really do want you to help us make it better. We've prepared a lot of things today to get us started, but really uh, there's work for us to do to, to even be ready to do the work. So we appreciate um, your spirit coming here to this table to help us Build it. So we really brought you here because you're experts and you have unique perspectives. And so right from the get-go here, we want you to, to bring that as you look at this and as you look at everything that we uh, work on together today. Yeah, I just want to also add that I mean, this is just the foundation to iterate that. And, uh, you know, it, it, and it was really a group that was brought together to really build on what Kim and her team have been doing. I mean, they've been doing a lot of fabulous work in this area. So, and we've taken it then to the next level to just put together a foundation so that we all, you know, can work and actually, you know, achieve something and work through a process that, that completes the work. So, again, just to reiterate, nothing is set in stone here. It's really about all of us working together on this. Uh, one of the newest members of this team here is the co-facilitators. But, um, yes, we're laying the foundation, and it's important that from the beginning, as they both said, that equity and inclusion and diversity is part of it. Cultural competence is a part of it. And so we're, our 
while we're laying the foundation, we also need your expertise and your experience to bring to bear on everything that we're doing. I'm going to ask a clarifying question. Um, when we asked for applications from folks, we said, we'd like your service for the next six months to help us hit the deadline of the master plan. That's all they committed to. <laughs> uh, and then this language talks about development, implementation, and evaluation, which is a 10-year project. So I just want to clarify, do people hear me a 10-year commitment or have they made any? <laughs> 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 okay. Lifetime. Oh. <laughs> I think hopefully, and correct me if I'm wrong, but hopefully we, in this process we will develop tools and systems to where, you know, it's, it's going to be an ongoing process and we will put those, those processes in place to where the next we can pick up on it. And they'll be able to ask those important questions about equity and we can, we can continue this process through on the, through the, throughout the 10 years. <laughs> and you can, not for life. <laughs> so, this, yeah, please, please. Mm -hmm. so this includes the foundational part as well as the implementation and the evaluation. You're asking for a commitment for all the no. pieces of it? No, so I, that's why I want to clarify that. Yeah. Do you want to respond to it, Rigo? No, no, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. well. So I think, it's, I think there's two things here. I think, um, in the six months that you've committed to, <laughs> we'd like you to help us make sure that we are set up for development, implementation, and evaluation with an equity lens. And then I think we at CDA, with the, with the help of the stakeholders, want to then pause and see where we are and what works. One option could be this group continues. One option could be this group evolves. One option could be many other things that you could brainstorm. Uh, we at CDA, I, I will speak for, we do not yet have any equity staff or equity office as some of our other departments like public health or healthcare services or social services do. Uh, we have not yet been through the Government um, Alliance for Racial Equity training, year-long training program that about two years ago State Department started going through and we are next. We're very excited to be starting. So I think in about six months we will have had this experience. We will have gone through the GARE, begun, begun the GARE experience and we will have a lot of learning. And so I think I just want to mark that point in the road that, that I think we should do this work and then see where we are. Uh, so I just wanted to clarify when we want the, everything we do now to have that 10-year lens, uh, you have not signed up for the next 10 years. <laughs> Unless we decide that so in a few months. Volunteers <laughs> are welcome. <laughs> we have a comment from somebody on the, on the phone, Karen, Karen Lucy. Wonderful. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Yes. Thank you. I, I just had a question. First of all, thank you to Kevin and Rigo for bringing this in, helping to bring this to fruition. Being on the subcommittee, the research subcommittee, you know, I've had some questions about the discussion or lack thereof of, of equity. And so I guess my question is, how will the discussions and findings from this group be integrated into the other subcommittees into the master plan overall. And so basically it's, you know, what is the relationship between the conversations that happen here and the conversations that are happening in the other groups and how, how is that going to be integrated? Uh, Ms. I, I can speak of that much. Uh, Karen, that's a terrific question. And there's a couple ways to answer it. And we're gonna spend a lot of the meeting working through that. But one of the answers is people like you who are in those places. So we were very intentional in that there are research committee members and LTSS committee members, and I believe every single work group, uh, uh, which will that will make sense in a minute, uh, has somebody here. So there's a built-in membership overlap. Uh, the other piece is the calendar and the, the review cycle. And so um, how does this equity feedback that we're going to talk about, for example, today, we're going to practice on the long-term services and supports, get shared back with the LTSS committee at their next meeting, and then at our every two months all stakeholder meeting, we would like an equity report to come. Uh, but we, we'll talk about that. How do you share it to the working subcommittee and then share it to the full group as well? So some of that's going to be asking people who are on those to do double duty, and some of that's going to be asking people who aren't on to come uh, as, as you are able to share that perspective in person or remote. 
So that's what we're going to co-create is that process. Okay, very good. Thank you. Should we, with that, pivot into master plan nuts and bolts so that we have that to kind of layer on? Okay. okay. <clears throat> yes, Marcy. I just have one question about the purpose statement. Hold on one sec, here comes the mic. Sorry. Someday we'll have them in the sky, too, but not yet. <laughs> We'll have dro maybe drones would help. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just one question on the purpose uh, statement, and I was wondering uh, why it says address resulting disparities rather than and and reduce social and health disparities. I mean, if I've only got six months, I want to do that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, yeah. I think that's a, a great uh, a great point, and we actually um, struggled with not so much struggle, but we debated about that. Um, first, we were like, we're going to eliminate. Wait, we can't do that. We're going to reduce. At the very least, we wanted something attainable, um, so at least address it. Because some things like implicit uh, bias, you you can't eliminate or reduce, but you you can't assure that or ensure that. But what you can do is make sure that you can at least touch and say we're going to acknowledge um, that this is here, but I think you are right uh, that reduce, that absolutely can, that's definitely something that we could um, think about, that we can at least do that. That's what this work is about, is what we're trying to do is re even reduce the chance or the potential of disparities. And looking at this again, I'm, I'm looking at that last sentence and saying actively identify and um, address potential disparities, because resulting disparities, hopefully, we don't have any, from our work, we're not resulting in any more disparities, right? So I think that's a, that's a good point, and that's a good comment. Can I make a quick comment to that? This is Karen Lincoln. So perhaps it could be, I don't know if the purpose of this work group would be to perhaps recommend strategies for reducing. I mean, I'm not sure if that's a goal of this group, but I imagine that at some point, we will be making some types of recommendations that might help to eliminate, or not eliminate, but to reduce disparities. Uh -huh. So perhaps we can use that language. Uh -huh. Yes, that's, that's a good point. And we, I think at some point we did have recommendations in here. Um, and we can definitely just bring that back in. Yeah. Great. Uh, I think uh, we will, um, Carmen's taken those edits, and I think the, 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 uh, I'll say that you can continue to send either email or ask to chat with Carmen, and she'll keep working on it. It's a living document. We tend in the master plan process not to ever finalize the language and vote on it and say it's uh, going into code. We keep it living. <laughs> um, so this will, we'll revise it, and it'll bring it back to you again next time. It will reflect this conversation and this discussion. Okay, so let me do, um, the master plan 101 for folks, and there's um, I'll, I'll, those of you who know the 201 level will say, what did I miss? What did I get wrong? So this starts in the very beginning with what all of you as aging experts already know, which is that California is aging. I just came from the county board of suits meeting, all the California board of suits meeting, and uh, just had an incredibly lively conversation about how they know this, they're seeing it, they're ready, they're not ready, uh, they're personally affected. Uh, this is really um, the story all across California uh, now and, of course, into the future. What we want to make sure that we uh, um, really, really focus on is that the fastest growth is in our elders of color of all groups. Um, and this is some data from Steve, Dr. Stephen Wallace from UCLA that I hope, uh, if you're not familiar with, I commend his work to you greatly. I got to know him at the Commission on Aging Forum in November, and we have just been partnering with him ever since. Uh, so again, the slide you can see. Well, the total number of elders uh, grows from 2010 to 2060. Gosh, that's too small even for my eyes. Uh, that triples. Um, you can see that the, the bar on the bottom of uh, white elders doesn't even double. Doesn't even double. While the top bar, which is the Latino, grows by a factor of like eight. So there's a huge um, uh, changing, so much so that right now, while our elders are majority white, uh, people of color will be the majority of elders in coming years as, as, as they are in the general population. So that's the 
number, but then I think we get this gets really interesting, and I want to sort of own this, that I think a lot of our Master Plan for Aging conversations so far have quickly gone from diversity to disparity and not taken enough time to talk about opportunity and resources. Uh, and so we wanted to just pause <laughs> and really remember that aging is both an opportunity and a challenge, and uh, that is certainly true with the diversifying of aging. Uh, the cultural resources of different cultures bring around aging and the traditions and the inclusion of elders is something all of California can learn from. There is so much cross-cultural competency that exists and there are gaps where it does not. Um, language access is always um, an issue in all of our services. We have taken baby steps here at um, with the Engage site now available in Spanish and traditional Chinese, but there is in California always more to do. Um, and then there are, of course, significant disparities that continue to compound and can really uh, lead to incredibly different aging experiences. Uh, and then I just want to, you know, remind us all, we're not, well, California likes to think we're the first and we're the leader and we're the best, and, you know, we are. Um, <laughs> there are also other people in this field doing lots and lots of work, and that's why we're so glad you all are here to show us. And, you know, yeah, our federal partners have had a toolkit on this for many years. Uh, there is work we can learn on and uh, adapt and apply to California. So again, some, some trying to frame it, but I also do want to spend some time on the difference, the, the two disparity slides, again, from Dr. Wallace, one on disability and how the different rates of disability among our elders um, almost double among Latino from um, white and African American and Asian right behind Latino. And then uh, poverty rates. Of uh, course, uh, while poverty amongst all elders is too high and obviously being seen in our streets with homelessness rising and hunger rising, uh, the disparities, uh, again, and in California we often talk about poor and near poor given the high cost of living. Uh, and again, Dr. Wallace has shown us that the high cost of living is not just a challenge in cities with high rents, it's also rural areas with high health care. Uh, that you see nearly 40% of our Latino elders are poor or non-poor, as well as African American and Native American, with only slightly lower rates for Asian and then white. So the, the disparities are real um, across race. And there's so much more data, again, here from the Research Committee, we can talk about gender and poverty as age, particularly in the over 80, LGBTQ and, and aging alone. So we can do a lot on that, but part of we, we didn't do much here because we know that's what you bring, the expertise, but we want to continue to get better at that. So the master plan with that framework, I'll be very quick. Um, this is the executive order that we had in June. It calls for my office, the Secretary, Dr. Galley, and Health and Human Services to convene two groups, the stakeholder advisory group of uh, 34 folks, about 12 of them, 10 or 12 of them are here, uh, and then the cabinet work group. To, all, to work on the Master Plan for Aging and give us a deadline of October 1st. We, did, as I mentioned earlier, we laid out um, a vision of California for All across the lifespan, trying to, to embed that California for All from the very beginning and making sure it was across the lifespan, not just all people over a certain age. It's all of us. And again, look at those values, respecting choices, equity, dignity and disruption of age bias, ableism, discrimination, inclusion, accessibility, innovation and evidence, and partnerships. In order to get our arms around this work, <laughs> we put it into four high-level goals. Uh, goal one is services and supports. We will live where we choose as we age and have the help we and our families need to do so. And here I'll get a little procedural. That work is being done by the LTSS subcommittee. Long -term, is that my second acronym in the meeting? Long-Term Services Support Subcommittee. And that's what we're going to hear from that subcommittee. We're going to hear about their work today because they were told in that same executive order to issue a report by March. So they've been running. <laughs> I see some of them here, so thank you so much for leaving the computer for a moment to, to, to come, come be with us. The other three goals um, have begun this, really this year. Uh, livable communities of purpose. We will live in and be engaged in communities that are, that are age-friendly, dementia-friendly, and disability-friendly. Goal three, health and well-being. We will live in communities and have access to services and care that optimize health and quality of life. And goal four, economic security and safety. We will have economic security and be safe from abuse, neglect, exploitation, and natural disasters and emergencies throughout our lives. Uh, goal two, goal three, and goal four, we did an experiment, decided not to create subcommittees in Sacramento, 
but to try something we're calling Webinar Wednesdays, where we're featuring a SAC member, a local leader, and a state government partner, and then lots of Zooming to get even more recommendations and ideas from people. So we've had, um, we're about six weeks into them, uh, and uh, they have been great. We're getting so much, uh, featuring so many wonderful leaders and hearing from so many people. Kevin just did homelessness, uh, poverty and hunger. Was that yesterday? It was yesterday. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then the SAC is um, just now convening work groups to kind of gather all that input from the webinar, from the website, uh, and bring recommendations. So I'm just giving you a little preview. That's coming next. Goal two, goal three, goal four. Um, and so we can talk about when and how uh, as those work groups get together. And let me just look around for a second. Livable Communities and Purpose uh, is currently being led by um, Nina Weiler Harwell from AARP and Jenny Chin Hansen. Does she say she's retired? What does she say? Uh, she's one of those also not retired people. She has many, many jobs, uh, formerly of AARP, but uh, of many, many things. Um, Health and well-being is being uh, led by Marty Lynch, who's in the room with us here, and uh, Maya Altman from San Mateo County um, Health Plan, and Dr. Fernando Gil Torres from UCLA. Thank you. I almost said USC, and that would have been no, terrible. You okay. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. That's really uh, Once upon a time at USC. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And then goal four is economic security and safety. And currently it's being held only by Kevin, but he's recruiting. <laughs> so, uh, we are looking for other SAC members to work with Kevin on very important issues of adult protection uh, and um, disaster, and that he will have he will have company soon. But they are getting to work uh, to bring recommendations to you at a coming meeting. So I gave you just a little sneak preview. All those recommendations are coming together in, in October. Um, recommendations will come in, and then the administration will. Um, recommendations will all come in in August. So we will sit, the SAC will be done in August with all of their wisdom, and then the administration will, in October, by October 1st, release a state plan, which is also a local blueprint. That will be very helpful to County Board of Supes and other locals uh, in thinking about how's our housing, how's our aging, how's our health care, how, uh, how are we ready. Uh, a, a first ever data dashboard on aging that we're building with the California Department of Public Health um, to, with the advice of the research subcommittee, um, and then a best practice toolkit. So as you look at your local blueprint and look at your local data and you want to make some changes, you can look at your other peer communities and uh, around the state or country or world and move forward. So um, again, we want to bring the dashboard to you all um, for input, at least the template um, early on, and then again, as the sources get populated, that could be something else uh, to look at. So all of those things are in flight. Um, let's look at the next slide. Uh, we are just at the end of, in June we started, and we're in this um, orange, we're at the very end of this orange, master plan framework of development, where we're getting all this information and input from committee meetings, from webinars, from community roundtables, from recommendation forms, um, lots of spreadsheets and Dropbox folders uh, happening. Um, the first product, the subcommittee, uh, you're going to hear about it today, but it's coming very soon to SAC. It'll be at SAC in March. And then in May, we're going to hear at SAC goal two, goal three, goal four, the dashboard. And then in August, we're going to pull it all together. So what we're trying to figure out with you all today is you're here today to hear about the March report. We want to hear from you again this spring on the goal two, goal three, goal four, and the dashboard. And we want to hear from you again as it all comes together. Let me just pause. Does that make sense to everyone, both people who've heard it before and people who've never heard it? <laughs> Is that tracking? Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Oh, and there's one other thing. While we are doing all these deliverables, we are trying to engage the public in master plan and aging in a way that we never have before. So this isn't so much a deliverable um, as uh, an activity that we are already, again, mid-flight in. So there are some things underway, like the engaged website being made a more public. We love our agency website; it's very accessible and useful, but not particularly friendly. So we tried to. Uh, we were very lucky, to, thanks to the foundation support, to have a more public-facing website, engagedca.org, that launched in January, and then again um, has some Spanish and Chinese uh, text, which is is new for us. Let me go back one slide. Let me see. Um, 
As I mentioned, we also are trying. Um, oh, let's see. Sure, it's fine. We're also trying this webinar Wednesday approach instead of committees, um, both to make it you don't have to come to staff, you don't have to have a half day, you don't have to, to try to make it a little more accessible. And so we'll see. It's an experiment in getting public uh, participation um, different way. And then the next thing we would love to get your advice on doesn't even have a slide. So this one, you're, you're right, the ground, ground, up, ground up, which is after all the webinar Wednesdays, we will have heard on 15 topics. Um, and we think that it would be great. I mean, there will have been a dozen community roundtables, and there will have been a dozen LCSS committee meetings, and there will have been a, eight research subcommittee meetings. We'd like to give the public one more kind of capstone chance to hear the whole thing. Right. And so we have this idea of June 17th as a day for some kind of virtual and real statewide town hall. I need to snap your name in the back. But where there could be places all over the state where people met to see a broadcast and participate and see kind of the whole thing and also vote and participate. We don't know what that looks like. We don't know how to make that accessible and meaningful and engaging to a diverse a diversity of Californians. So we are just beginning to think about that. We haven't put the save the data, but we really love uh, this table advice on that. So that's one of the things we're thinking also for the next meeting is we would get some co-creation around even what to call that thing. Mm -hmm. What is that? I don't know yet. Capstone Town Hall. I don't know. So those that's everything I know about the math. <laughs> 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 well <done. laughs> Any questions or comments before we switch to Yes. Thank you, Pam. Jeffrey, so uh, thanks for that um, overview. Do you have any um, sense of how many comments have been received cool. through the Engage website and how it's cut down by, by language oh. with the Spanish and the Chinese translation? Well, you mean, oh, good, so I, can, I think Carrie and Jen could probably tell you how many comments have come in. I, I, 700. There's, right now, there's 700 public comments um, that have come in through January. Um, but in terms of recommendations, I would say we're at about the 200 mark. And kind of the difference of, between comments and recommendations, recommendations usually are longer and have more policy. Yeah. And, but I think they all come in in English. English. Okay. Yeah, and we just sent our, I think, our first tweet in Spanish last week. Uh, but we don't have the ability to interact. We don't have staff who are bilingual at this point. So it's baby steps. That's why you partner with us. That's yes. hi. Yeah. Yes. Yes. You see the possibilities. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Dr. Derek Lamb, ATC Senior Services 3. You want to commend uh, the California Department of Aging for translating the website in Spanish and uh, Chinese. So if we have any suggestions for improvement, uh, we still got time to do it, so the translation is more accurate. I just want you to know, in terms of Chinese recommendation, ACC is going to host a Cantonese speaking uh, master plan for aging for uh, next Wednesday. Oh and I'll cite Cantonese only, so we'll be able to really provide you with some uh, recommendations from just Cantonese speaking. But also, we have hosted three different forums, you know, in the last three weeks, and so we'll be feeding you with those as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are you sure that time and data somehow send out that information? Yes. Sure. Well, the, uh, the next one will be next Wednesday, the 19th, between 2 p.m. to 3.30 over at ACC Center Services, 7334, Park City Drive. It's in a public green haven neighborhood, and it's at Kennedy's only. But uh, we previously actually have free English speaking forums, so we have uh, some very useful recommendations that we can share with you. Just a general question, not on language. How do I follow you on Twitter? What is your Twitter name? Great question. The best way, the best Twitter is our Department of Aging Twitter handle, which is? Cal Aging. Thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> Cal Aging. And the, we have been using the hashtag Master Plan for Aging, but Cal Aging is where we're pushing out meeting, a content, webinar. 
in English right now. Linda uh, with C10. Um, I would just echo the comments um, made previously about kind of the efficacy of holding forums that are very um, tailored to the communities uh, they're trying to get feedback from. Um, just in terms of the, um, the virtual and in-person town hall, um, I just think in terms of turnout, I think it's we'd be remiss to not um, you know acknowledge that there's a lot of political fear and a lot of um, you know the chilling effect related to public charge. Um, you know, it's really scary for a lot of immigrant communities to interface with governmental workers, especially in such a setting like that. So um, I would just ask you to be mindful about kind of, um, you know, the types of uh, political attacks coming down and kind of hindering people's ability to want to engage in such a public setting like that. Um, so doing things like in the community, in language, um, among trusted partners, I think is the best way to get like really authentic data. Um, and very like trusted, candid um, feedback. Um, yeah, yeah, and just using community to find approaches. Um, I totally understand kind of like wanting to do something very big and global, um, kind of inviting everybody in, but I think kind of localizing it might be a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm hearing a theme around public education through community at, at the community level. But I think we could all agree, particularly those who are part of a community-based kind of organization, that it takes quite a bit of resources and time to be able to pull that out. So as much as we would like to carry that out, and particularly those of us who are serving the underrepresented communities, it, you know, we need that we need resources to make that happen and assistance. So perhaps that is uh, something as a call out and perhaps a recommendation to foundations and others who could support this kind of work uh, around the master plan. I know that uh, a number of the foundations have been doing incredible work and in, in working with community-based organizations like mine in organizing and bringing people together, but not with a specific lens to diverse community per se. So maybe we add that as more intentional that we use, we identify resources to work with community-based organizations to be able to enable us to achieve this goal. Well, thank you so much for all these comments um, and these um, these suggestions and recommendations. And it's wonderful to have this group together and talk about how do we reach out to those populations that have been underrepresented and how do we get them represented in this plan. And now we're talking about resources to do it. So we've already made great, great strides in that. And I think it just tees up that we'll do this, that this engagement issue around the June event and just to, you know, yeah. go even further afield. Uh, many of you may know that in October, the SCAN Foundation traditionally has an aging event, uh, and Sarah Steenhausen is here from the SCAN Foundation, and I think they are beginning to think about what would it look like to make that be more of an inclusive, multi-foundation, multi-community kickoff of implementation. So is there a way in which this online work leads to the June, leads to October? So let's tee up a way to have a good conversation about that soon. Because all of a sudden it's right. February. Should we move into other other reactions or comments about the work we're going to do? Yes, please. I just want to support what you said. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's it's useful not to wait too late to ensure that it's useful not to wait too late to ensure that something like that happens. Yeah. And given how intense this work is, it would be very easy, it would seem to me to look forward to getting funding, but not do it soon enough. Mm -hmm. So I really want to uh, jump in on that bandwagon and say that uh, doing it localized and in a language or in a cultural setting that people are familiar with is going to pay off, I think, a lot better than a very large, uh, I mean, the very large thing I think should be done. But I think if we're really expecting people of color and different language to participate uh, intensely like we would like them to, a special accommodation needs to be mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have 
I, I, uh, so Bernice Nunez constant um, stakeholder advisory committee member. And so when you spoke, Linda, my immediate was my immediate thought was like it would be awesome to leverage CPENs to do something, right? So we were very strategic in the conversations and choosing you all to be around the table. So I want to challenge this group to say if you know AARP can they convene a group? Can CPEN do something? So think about, think about it in that way. Like, what is it that you all can offer so that you can really help us, like, do the actual work? Because I, I think that's what we all want to want to do, not just theoretically thinking about how we would reach them, but what can CPEN do, what can ARP, like, you know, coalition, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah, also, um, I have a comment, I don't know if this is the right place, but just to share an experience. I'm also on the board of Community Action Board in Santa Cruz County. Do you know the Community Action Agency? Mm -hmm. out of it? <clears throat> and in every two years, Community Action Board CAB meets, uh, has a community, community engagement to talk about poverty, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. how they mm -hmm. the needs in the community and allocation of funds. And I'm, I, I became a board member in 2016, and there was some discomfort about calling the community, the low-income community, and just asking about, you know, what's wrong in your life. <laughs> and I came in saying, you know, let, let's change the conversation. So we came up with a whole strategy of community engagement around listening circles and pop-up conversations, and out of that, you know, part of the change in the conversation was asking not only about needs, but about assets. What else, what else the yes, assets? Yes, the yes, yes. So out of that, and then that's what they reported, not only on needs, but by assets. So they came up with now the language around the flower. And, and, and then they, they, they came up with a report, and I think that I sent that link, uh, an equity-based approach to poverty. And the way that they defined the equity lens was around cultural humility, political courage, and action. So for me, that's really, I mean, I resonate a lot with what you're saying and how to, how to engage at that level with a popular education or those methods. That, that's a little bit where I would love also to provide input. Thank you. This is terrific because absolutely nothing has been decided about June 17th except hold June 17th. So uh, it could be that there is no that there's no central event that there's a central you know video or toolkit and it's only listening. So I mean, really, it's for this group and other tables to really think about what would be the most valuable uh, and doable in the timeline. And I and you know we are in regular contact with the seven the seven foundations who are funding our researchers and our snacks. Uh, and uh, our website, and so hearing the needs that require more resources is very helpful, and we can take that back. So thank you, got that. Um, I think it's time for my co-facilitators to take us, I'm going to jump over to the LTSM because we're going to do that next. So let's go right to reviewing key terms and developing an MPA equity tool with Carmelita and Kevin and Rigo, if that's okay? Thank you. Do you want to hand it to me? So the three of us, Sam, Kim, and Carmen, have been working to really think about, you know, what is it that we all need as our own tools to do our work, and uh, and I think there's, you know, we 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 identify that um, we we should start with together defining the difference between equality and equity, because those sometimes are confused. Now. I'm not, we're not making any assumptions about us around the table because I think, you know, we're pretty strong and we, we, but we also as individuals may think of it slightly different from one person to the next. So as we embark in our work together in the process of reviewing the long-term services reports report and other work that we're going to have the charge to review to help make recommendations through an equity lens, it's important that we take this time now to really look at what's equality, what's equal versus equity, right? And so that we are very clear in terms of our mandate moving forward, having a clear definition of how we're defining it together. At the same time, I think we all, as groups and as individuals, also bring our own sort of biases, their implicit biases. 
So as we're doing our work, I think it's going to be important to be aware of that. And so we want to take a moment today to have that conversation about what, what it is, what, what is implicit bias, and how does it show up. And perhaps we might even be thinking about even to the point where what are some things that we could do to help ourselves be aware. Because as we're doing our work through this process, you know, we want to also be checking ourselves. So, and then I think we're going to go also, you know, into the process of uh, identifying a toolkit, if you will, to achieve our work. You know, is it just, we've done some work behind the scenes, we've looked into other areas of what other organizations and other groups have done in, in around this area, so we're not starting from scratch. Um, and so there are some ideas that we have come to collectively brought together, and so we're going to be sharing those with you. And some are, you know, I shouldn't say it's simple, but simplifying, there are a set of questions right, that really help us to get at the, at, you know, at the, at the heart of our work. So with that, I'm going to pass this over to Carmelita to help us and to kick off this exercise of defining uh, equality versus equity. Start with that. Okay, so our charge is to review the recommendations from an equity, through an equity lens. And I guess the question is, what do we mean by equity? How will we know it when we see it? Will we recognize it? You know, what's it feel like, equity? So, So the, the, graph, the graphic that we came up with is something I think has been used in several workshops uh, in the past, and, and maybe you've seen it. Has anybody seen this before? Okay. Okay. So maybe I don't need to walk you through this, but anyway, in the first graphic, it, uh, I can't even read this. It is assumed <laughs> that everyone will... In the first image, it's assumed that everyone will benefit from the same support. They are being treated equally. In the second image, individuals are given different supports to make it possible for them to have equal access to the game. They are being treated equitably. In the third image, all three can see the game without any supports or accommodations because the cause of the inequity was addressed. The systemic barrier has been removed. And I think that's where we want to get to in terms of looking at what these plans will look like, that we want to be able to say that these are really being viewed and implemented from an equity standpoint. So I guess just to summarize, are there any questions about the graphic? Can we agree to maybe that would be the definition that we're looking at in terms of equity? That essentially it is a process. Moving from equality to equity is a process. Equity is an approach that ensures everyone has access to the opportunities. That the MPA must strive for equity. Equity is the foundation upon which the MPA is built. It's not an add-on. It's not just a nice thing to do. It's an integral part of the plan. We're we reviewing its structural and inherent to everything that we do. Okay. That's what we can strive for anyway, right? Yes, yes. So another important concept that we thought about was the notion of okay. implicit bias. And so here are some definitions. Implicit bias refers to the attitudes or stereotypes that affect our understanding, actions, and decisions in an unconscious manner. Implicit biases are activated involuntarily and without an individual's awareness or intentional control. Implicit biases are per pervasive. Everyone possesses them, even those with avowed commitments to impartiality. I thought I had an avowed commitment to impartiality until I sat on a hiring panel to choose the next director for a, a position. And this person walked in and uh, obviously was qualified because he was one of the five finalists, and he was wearing a toupee. And all I could think of was, 
He's hiding something. Uh, he's not being real. And I started to focus on the toupee. I tried very hard not to focus on that toupee, but it was very difficult not to. And luckily, you know, after discussion with the rest of the group, he, he did not rise up to the final candidate. But it surprised me, surprised myself, that I had this feeling about someone who was trying to better himself, but in my mind was trying to hide something. So those kinds of things surface without us knowing. And you start to feel a little uncomfortable with it, and you start to wonder, where the heck did that come from? Okay. And I'm sure you all have some examples also in terms of maybe being the center or, or the center of a uh, you know, unconscious bias, or also being the recipient of unconscious bias. I'll give you one more example. Uh, sixth grade, I'm in Catholic school, and the nun gives us a form to fill out that says uh, name, address, etc. What hospital were you born in? Well, I wasn't born in a hospital. I was born in the Philippines at home with my parents. So I turned it in, it was blank. Okay. And so um, the nun said to me, go home and ask your mother where you were born. So I asked my mother. I knew the answer. You were born at home. So um, I turned in the, the form blank again. And finally, after the third time, I said, okay. <laughs> my brother was born at St. Mary's Hospital in San Francisco. So I started putting down, I was born at St. Mary's Hospital in San Francisco. And whoa, wow. All of a sudden, no issue, no problem. And I thought, okay, <laughs> this is what it feels like to, to, to not belong, to be different. Uh, but then from then on, I started trying to find ways to fit in, to say, okay, I was born in St. Mary's Hospital, you know, whatever they wanted to hear, I began to use those kinds of answers or, in order just to say, yes, uh, I belong here. Um, so the next, I guess, example that I wanted to talk about a little bit is, is a more public example of this implicit bias. Uh, I think it's up there somewhere. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, does anybody remember the 1998 Olympic uh, women? figure championship, the Olympics. Mm -hmm. Michelle Kwan was on the uh, U.S. team. Uh, and Japan is similar as ahead of us. Well, Gerald Lipinski won the gold medal. Right? So the headline read across MSNBC and then picked up by several newspapers that said, Tara Lipinski wins gold. American beats Kwan. This was picked up in several newspapers across the country. American beats corn. So who defines who is an American? Uh, fast forward to Hurricane Katrina, where photos of people trying to, to survive during the hurricane, photos of a black family uh, you know, holding stuff above their heads and wading through uh, waist-deep water were described as looters, looters. The same family, or a, a, a comparable family, which happened to be white, were identified as survivors. So who gets to be a survivor and who gets to be a looter? And again, it's all sort of that implicit bias. And I think, as Rio says, what's important to remember about this is to, to, to acknowledge that we are all whole of implicit bias. We don't necessarily know where, we, where they come from, but as we're putting together plans, as we're reviewing the recommendations, to make sure that we stop ourselves and say, am I looking at this completely impartial, and if there is some bias there, what can I do about it? So we do have a handout. There is a handout that we are going to give out, and it's, it's uh, it's five ways to mitigate unconscious bias and implicit bias. And it's just a tool that you all can use, whether you want to or not, <laughs> to help check your own unconscious bias. Any questions? 
We'll try to broadcast it on the Zoom or at least include it. It's okay. Or at least include it in after action materials if we're not able to. To the committee members, but the public may not be able to see it. We will be posting it um, with the public materials as soon as we can. Quality LCSS today. How are those challenges addressed in the report? 
flood disparities exist in access and quality of LCSS for those communities? And how does the, how does the, the report uh, address those disparities? What are the systemic inequities that have created these disparities? Um, are there proposed recommendations that are responsive to the disparities and the inequities, and how? Um, referring to the graphic that Carmelita reviewed for us today, are we at full equity, or do we still need to do work to get there? Um, if the proposals uh, um, in the report are not responsive to these disparities and inequities, how would the recommendations need to be changed, or what would need to be added so that they are responsive? And then on the next slide, um, do the proposed recommendations create any new or exacerbate existing inequities and disparities? We want to make sure we're not going in the wrong direction. And then how, if at all, are the unique needs of uh, these communities uh, addressed in the recommendations? Yeah. This is a good time for a question. Yeah. Or so I, I really love the, the starting point, and I think this is a good place for us to jump off from. So thank you for the work that's been done there. I love that you, you're using existing models as well. One thing um, that I think was brought up earlier when someone talked about access, I really wonder if we could integrate more of a strength-based approach into this, because it all feels very kind of dreary um, and dark. And, and it's very, there's a lot of disparities, disparities, disparities. But how can we integrate the strength of various different communities, um, racial, ethnically diverse communities, into you know the tool and the framework as well. So just encouraged for that to be part of our discussion as well. Hi, this is Karen. I I appreciate that that comment. Um, you know, as, as someone who is preoccupied with equity, it is sort of disparities, disparities, disparities. But I think, and I think it's, it needs to be. Right, because it's a very important topic for us to think about and try to integrate into this plan. Um, perhaps one way we can reframe some of the language at some point is to think about, you know, the, the cultural relevancy um, and you know the, the tailoring that might need to be go that that might need to be happen as we move forward. Um, because if we talk about making sure that the plan is relevant for cultures. Um, for different cultures, it does send a message that there is there's value there, right? Um, and we want to make sure that the, these cultures and these understandings are integrated into the plan. And so I, I think it's difficult when we're talking about equity um, to not talk about disparities. I don't think we're being pejorative, but we have inequities, right? But if we frame it in such a way where we are trying to address these disparities in a way that acknowledges and respects the differences. Um, maybe we can bring in more positive language. Um, <clears throat> hi, this is Valentine. Oh. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, I just wanted to just dovetail on what Dr. Lincoln just said. Um, completely agree with you, um, Karen. And also I think, um, need to buoy, if you will, strengthen, empower those cultural practices um, that support families, support older adults, um, and look at those, how we can support them um, to make things better. Um, but I, I, I think it's important also to acknowledge that the disparities are there, but also that there are part of culture um, buoys the aging process and, and how can we strengthen sort of those natural networks, if you will. Mm -hmm. So just to, uh, not just the disparity, but the cultural relevancy that Dr. Lincoln raised and the strengthening and empowering cultural practices that, that, that buoy the aging process from Dr. From Valentine, I'm sorry, Dr. Valentine. <laughs> Dr. Beard. Right. And I should have introduced myself, sorry, Leandra um, from Community Behavioral Health Agency. One more thing, are we comfortable as a group with the term uh, people of color and communities of color? That's been used a lot. And um, I know that uh, in certain fields, in behavioral health fields, we try to move, uh, kind of move away from that and say racially and ethnically diverse, not ethnically minorities, 
not going to be the case here. Mm -hmm. um, but I just think that as we create this, we need to be very um, intentional and very careful about our language. And people of color, I think, is a term that's kind of becoming a little outdated, and, and, you know, at least in some fields. And so just want to open that up to the group. We might all agree that it's fine, um, but did want to share that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And who we do that with? That you are uh, racially, racially and ethnically diverse group. Well, I'll just add, this is Karen. I didn't know I was a person of color until I moved from um, Ann Arbor where I was going to school to Seattle. And um, the faculty said people of color and I had no idea what they were talking about because I've always been African-American, right? So I, I don't identify strongly um, with that terminology because it, it's confusing and I think it homogenizes uh, a lot of the very different groups, uh, and we sort of miss some of those differences. They're obscured, right, when um, they're aggregated. So maybe racial and ethnic um, groups uh, or racial and ethnic diverse or something that will at least acknowledge that we're, when we're talking about communities of color, we are in fact talking about race and ethnicity. I agree with Dr. Lincoln. Jeffrey, I also, also second and third those comments. I also was thinking um, from like an equity framework, uh, there's a move towards not addressing the individual, there's a role for individuals and individual identity, but really the structural drivers. So rather than race, it's racism. Rather than woman, it's um, gender discrimination. Rather than immigration status, it's uh, xenophobia. So really like addressing those upstream drivers and more systems and policies that are causing those disparities and those inequities at an individual level. I really like what this is Rita says. I really like uh, this conversation that we're having and I want to caution us that we also don't want to go in the other direction of the kind of myths that people have about our communities. You know, well, Chinese people really respect old people. They're large families, uh, Hispanic families. A lot of those things are changing. So, uh, you know, I, I think for people of my generation, the issue of, you know, that there were large families, et cetera, there are nine kids in our family, so there was, you know, somebody to rely on. But also, like, oh, it's not only in the caregiver area where we know that because of the migration of people, how people are moving around, how people's financial situations are, that a lot of those things that have been said about our communities, or a number of people are no longer true, which is why we have isolation with elders, why we have transportation problems getting to medical appointments, and why people cannot afford their medicine. Mm. When thinking about diverse communities, I think it's important to recognize disability communities have unique identities and cultures as well and experience some of the same discrimination um, that other people have been speaking to. And I think finding a way to recognize that within the equity lens that we're all talking about is, um, is important. So I, you know, I'm kind of a fan of the infographic that we showed earlier with you know, how do we create equity, but I'll note that if you were a person that used a wheelchair, those boxes weren't going to help you achieve equity at all. And so it's worth thinking about diverse communities. It's what is the impact for uh, on a, a racial and ethnic uh, diverse community, and then what, what is the subset of that that might be people with disabilities from that community as well. I definitely want to agree with what, uh, how do you say your first name? Uh, yeah. Clark Harvey. Oh, yeah. What's the first one? Leandra. Yeah. 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 Leandra said about uh, communities of color versus racial and ethnic people or communities. Because if someone says community of color, I don't necessarily identify as that. I'm an African American woman. And so when they, and, and a lot of times I think using those words that uh, make everybody the same diffuse what is unique to my community. So, yeah, some other type of uh, language. So, why don't we take a question from Linda or a comment, and then 
I'd like to welcome our representatives from the LTSS subcommittee to start to share what they've come up with, and we can further think about these questions as we're also responding to what they've developed. Yeah, I would also just echo, you know, all the comments that were made and also just kind of just calling out um, that we're really talking about intersectional identities, um, especially looking at privilege and how that kind of comes into the mix um, because, you know, whether you, um, you know, experience a, a different ability, you know, that's going to look different based off of your racial or ethnic identity and you still might experience privilege, although you do have other you know, aspects of really that it create uh, discrimination. So just kind of being mindful of that kind of like holistic look at, at what identity means. Um, and then also just wanted to say too, like as far as the quality of life um, for our elders is heavily dependent on the people that serve them. And so addressing the implicit bias of, you know, home care workers or um, people who, um, you know, work in, in the medical field and, uh, and this is purely anecdotal, so please have that in the back of your mind. But um, I come from a Filipino-American family. Um, a lot of my relatives uh, work in the healthcare space. Um, they're also extremely religious, very heavily Catholic, and a lot of those biases against the LGBT community um, can kind of manifest and rear their head when they're dealing with their patients. Um, and so I think as far as you know, ensuring that we're looking at quality of life, looking at equity, you know, making sure that our elders are in the hands of people who are well trained and have like the cultural competency to provide equitable care is just as important. Mm -hmm. okay, so, um, thank you. So, I, I think we're now going to welcome members from the LTS subcommittee. Uh, to present their recommendations. I want to thank them for being here. I also want to thank them for being guinea pigs <laughs> um, in this effort. So the other work groups that follow uh, this one will hopefully have some uh, version of questions we've developed for, to inform their work as they go. And I think it's okay to admit here that the aging space um, is learning a lot from other movements about how to really de to think deeply about these equity issues. And so, um, so appreciate the conversation we've been having so far, and we're going to continue to have. And appreciate you all for uh, coming here, even though this equity emphasis was really added uh, as your work was already ongoing, and you all were taking on a tremendous amount. Um, so thanks for being here and being open to uh, further feedback and refinement from this group. I'll let you introduce yourself. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Susan Morris with the Alzheimer's Association. I'm a member of the Stakeholder Advisory Committee and have been working with the LTSS work group. And good afternoon. My name is Sarah Steenhausen. I'm with the SCAN Foundation. Um, and it's a real honor to be here and I really appreciate the discussion and look forward to, to your thoughtful input on how we can make our uh, LTSS report more informed by equity. So thank you. So first off, we're in very good hands. My blood pressure went down when I walked in and I saw all of you assembled around the table <laughs> because you're, you're really the experts and the leaders in our state and you were all chosen for a reason and I want to thank our colleagues that elevated the, the concept of an equity work group is essential to the master plan and to California. So it's just great that that idea translated to today's table and, and you're having your first meeting. So, um, Are there any others on the line, possibly Lydia Missolides or Claire Ramsey? You could Lydia on. is on that. Okay. She's one of the so we're, we're joined virtually by two of our colleagues. Um, so a key word in, in development of the LTSS report, which is due March 2nd, um, is iterative. And I ha it is iterative. And it is iterative, and this is an example today. Even the graphic you see behind you, it's old. <laughs> <laughs> meaning, um, meaning like two weeks. Two, right, like two that, weeks that, that, that's last two weeks ago. Yeah. A, a, new, a new graphic is in development because, and I think it's such a strength of this process that um, whether it's one person um, emailing a comment or a recommendation or a member of any of the work groups, 
um, as ideas surface, they're being incorporated um, and included, and, and for that reason, it's iterative. So we're working against that timeline to get that report um, finished by March uh, 2nd. Um, and I think this is another example of an iterative process, that this wasn't even conceived in the executive order, and fortunately, we're here today um, meeting. So um, we're at a key juncture, and I'm going to move quickly. I know you're running behind, so you can skip that. I'll skip that. Okay. Um, so this is the charge of the long-term services and supports work group. Again, iterative, it was called the long-term care work group. We renamed it the LTSS work group. Um, and we have four um, tasks in front of us. And um, this has been our focus, which it would seem simple. It fits on the slide, not so simple, <laughs> to um, focus on everything related to LTSS in the state of California for those who rely on Medi-Cal and those who do not, um, and older adults of all ages and people living with disabilities. So um, while, while our task is narrow, our, our audience is large. Early in the process, the master plan for aging. Oh, thank you. Thank Carmen. <laughs> there we go. Um, so you'll see that, um, let's see the next, okay, great. So now I can, can get that. They're not the same, it's but you, you do this and I'll do this okay. so you can see what you're doing. Yeah. So our placeholder um, to date until um, the tool is developed and we get guidance today and in future days. Um, we've, we've adopted the master plan values that were um, discussed and agreed to by the stakeholder advisory committee. And so you'll see here um, equity is, is a value that's um, overarching all of the work, all of the subcommittees and work groups. Um, and we want to be sure that you, did they see this before we got here? The slide? Uh, or the, the values of the master plan? I think they saw them yesterday. Okay. So this would be, this is, has been our working definition of equity in terms of the LTSS report. We talked the meeting too. Okay. 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 Yes, yes. Um, and then we also heard, you know, age bias, ableism, and discrimination were, were referenced already. So that, that's um, included as well. Process. So our process, it's been very process rich. <laughs> um, we started just a few months ago um, when the subcommittee was formed and individuals were named, just as you were named a short while ago in your meeting today. There have been eight deep dive set meetings on a variety of topics, all related to LTSS. Those have been um, a wonderful format where there's been a state lead, somebody from state, um, a state department who's an expert, um, a member of the stakeholder or LTSS work group, and a community or a best practice or model that's held up. So the, it's been a wonderful deep dive format that we've been following. So each deep dive has included several perspectives on the same issue. Um, as you heard, we've had hundreds of comments and recommendations, uh, lots of public comment. Every meeting has been open to the public and we've taken public comment. Um, and so we started with an initial framework. That was the visual that you saw um, up originally. We thought, we can put this into three buckets and put all, we needed a way to organize ourselves. So we, we started with, I don't want you to spend a lot of time on this framework because we sent the band of it, but it, it helped us organize, <laughs> organize our work and, and start to um, boil the ocean. Um, and then subcommittee members self-identified as writing team captains. And some of them are in this room. Catherine is one of them. Um, and that has been a real strength of this work group. It, all of the work, every word that you will see in the draft was generated by the subcommittee and looking at, and Carrie Graham gets a lot of credit for um, on demand. You know, if a new comment or recommendation comes in while we're writing, she gets it, gets it to us. Um, and so experts owned each subject area and started working in teams. So every member of the LTSS work group is represented on at least one of the teams, bringing, you know, vetting and um, reviewing comments and recommendations as a group. Um, and then we produced our first draft um, on January 27th. It was around 40 pages. Um, and I'll just say at this point, 
I thought we'd be presenting to you the January 27th draft. When we scheduled this meeting, I thought, we'll share that with you, and you'll have this draft to read and reflect. Well, then they totally tore it up and rewrote it. So, <laughs> Which is the strength of the process is we brought it to the group and said, okay, this is our, this is our first draft, and um, let's see. So what we hope for in the report, we hope it's accurate. We hope it's actionable, so it's not a lot of flowery language that just sounds good, but how do you turn it into a bill or a regulation or a budget act? We want it to be ambitious, and Kevin has encouraged us to be bold in our thinking. Um, we want it to be equitable, um, personal and person-centered. We've really struggled with not sounding wonky and policy-ish. How does this sound personal and person-centered? It's a 10-year uh, vision, so we need to be provocative and not just think of what's what our immediate needs are, and we want it to be reflective of what we have heard and what we continue to hear um, from the public, from SAC, from work groups. <laughs> so the report that will go to the stakeholder advisory committee um, is focused squarely on LTSS, so that's your first warning. You may not see everything that you expect in there because our charge is narrow. It's LTSS. Um, and there are three other goal areas of the master plan that are working concurrently on livable communities, healthy aging, and economic insecurity and protection. Um, it's the what and not the how. Believe me, that's been the hardest. It's how do we, how do we not take a good idea and drill down to you know, be very prescriptive. But um, we're trying to avoid that. Um, it's our best attempt to date. Um, it's intended for multiple audiences. It is, it is a, a document for the Stakeholder Advisory Committee. It's a document for the governor and the administration. It's a document for the public. And it's a living document. It will live on after it's adopted or not. Um, we have to keep reminding ourselves, because we want to get it right, it's not the master plan for aging. That's coming out in October. And so every time we want, we're tempted to put more in it, you know, we say, wait, but wait, there's more. Um, it's also not a consensus document. We've, we've wrestled with, if we don't agree to something, should we kick it out? Well, no. We don't want a watered-down version that only has things that everyone agrees to. But then how do we, how do we frame things where there's dissension and disagreement or, and controversy? We want it to be provocative. Um, and we really don't want it to be a litany of everything in the state of California, uh, every program that ever existed, every eligibility category, um, and we, we keep going there too. <laughs> um, and it's not focused solely on Medi-Cal, so it's not a public benefit primer either. It's intended to include um, private and philanthropic endeavors as well, um, programs that aren't covered by Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, or VA. And we don't want it, it's already around 40 pages, just with all of these constraints. Um, so we really don't want it to be granular. So people, we're warning you, you may not see things that you want to see in there. Um, yep, it's a big reveal. Yep. Okay. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah. Um, to talk about how this slide is also out of date. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, well, as you can see, this is all a work in progress. So we appreciate your patience. And also don't have my glasses with me. Right? <laughs> uh, so the way that we have structured the report, again, we're really struggling between wanting to have this be a readable document that's accessible for everybody, but also not wanting to lose the important substance of these issues. So I think there is a balance between the two, but it's something we're constantly struggling with. A lot of the time when you're in your little domain writing about an issue, uh, you don't realize that how you're writing it might be completely like Greek to somebody else who's not necessarily, necessarily thinking about these issues every day. But that's dangerous because if, if it's not a document that can be communicated well, it's not going to be of any use, right? So that's one issue. And the other issue is how to, um, how to ensure, as Susan said, that we are able to work across the stakeholders in not only in the LTSS subcommittee, but outside of the LTSS subcommittee to hear from them, to hear their input, and to make sure that this is a, a fair report. So 
what we've done is we have really now the, the recent approach is to focus on five big uh, objectives, five main objectives. And the important thing about these main objectives is that they're supposed to encapsulate everything that is critical to improving the system of care with this, of LTSS with the sole goal of uh, designing around the needs of the person. Also recognizing that not every person is the same. And so what we really, really would love to hear from you is how to ensure that equity is a very prominent part of this report. How to ensure that it is front and center, recognizing the, the, the uh, kind of balance that we're trying to strike between being concise but being substantive. So I wish we had something to share with you today, but hopefully that will be within the week. You will see something. So with that, I want to just quickly provide a high-level overview of the five um, priority areas. I'm happy to answer questions about what is contained within those areas, but really after that, we'd love to hear from you about how to frame equity in the report. Kim? And I just want to add, the report, the first first draft that was discussed at the subcommittee on January 27th is posted. So if you do want to see kind of that stage of the process, there is a 40-page document with 45 recommendations in it. 50, 60. So when you hear them talk about what is focused leadership, you can find that leadership section in that old draft and get a sense of, oh, this means these things. So there's some raw material out there, but it has been heavily refined since January 27th, and it's going to be continually refined on the way to March 2nd. But there is that um, more detail there if you want it. Right. Yes. Very important point. So. So the five big priority areas, again, each of these are critical um, needs that need to be met in order to uh, meet the goals of the master plan related to LPSS. Uh, equity, we really think, as I said, is something that not just crosses over all issues, but needs to be prominently featured. So for example, the first domain, uh, or sorry, priority area that um, the focus is leadership. So you can't move the system forward without really strong leadership, starting with the governor to the Health and Human Services Agency and the state, um, and also down to the local level. So that's the first area, and we have a, a few ob objectives underneath that. The second is this issue of navigation, and we've really struggled with how you, what's the terminology there. But essentially what it's trying to get at is how do people access services? not what services there are, but how do they get there? I'm sure a lot of you have seen in your own work and in your personal lives the challenges that people face across all areas of the state in just trying to find and locate the services they need when they need it, but also in the tremendous fragmentation that exists across the, the whole system, from healthcare to long-term services and support to housing to transportation, et cetera. Um, so, and then the third kind of priority area is the issue of what services are available. What is the access to care, to services and supports, and what's the infrastructure surrounding that? So that's where you get at a lot of the unmet need and where I think a lot of equity issues are really featured um, in, in terms of where people live and not being able to access services, cultural competency of services, um, just to name a few. The fourth big priority area is workforce, and this also is a really critical area um, when you consider the equity uh, frame, because as you all know, we don't have a workforce that's prepared to meet the needs of our big population. So it contains a number of recommendations um, along the lines of looking at the LTSS workforce, because again, this was one we struggled with. There were a lot of recommendations that came in that kind of crossed over into the healthcare realm, and we really, again, are trying to focus on the issues in LTSS and the workforce related to LTSS. Not just paid workforce, but also critically important is the unpaid caregiver workforce of family and friends who provide support to older adults and people with disabilities across the state. So, again, trying to represent both of those workforce needs in that area. And then finally, financing. How is the system financed, but how do people pay for their care? 
So we're looking at it kind of from those two lenses. And, um, you know, we really see that with all of those issues, they're all interrelated. So, for example, we can't build up access to the system if we don't have a way to finance it. And if you build up access to the system but people don't know, it, know how to navigate it, they're not going to be able to get what they need. And if you don't have the workforce to support any of that, then you're not going to have a system. So it goes, and if you don't have the state leadership, then there's not going to be the will to change. And I think that's what's so critical about this moment is we have this new leadership at the state and this tremendous opportunity. So that's, Susan, is there anything else you want to add in terms of the very high level kind of organization of the report? Oh, I will add what we're trying to encapsulate within that in the report what are some near-term big ideas within each of those areas that can be acted on in the immediate future? Not just what the term is low-hanging low fruit, because low-hanging fruit are important, but they often aren't the big system change issues. So what are the big system change issues that can happen in the near term under each of those areas that the committee can bring forward as a high-priority recommendation um, for the state to consider? So that's something else that we're currently working through. So it's a work in progress, and that's why this is a really helpful conversation to have now. I know it would have been, uh, you know, to have something to respond to would have been maybe more informative for all of you, but at the same time, it helps us to go back as we're working through this next draft to hear your feedback and your thoughts. So thank you. Okay, here we go. We have a system where we'd like you to turn your card up if you're in the room, if you'd like to get in the queue. Uh, look at Donna and Leandra modeling. Thank you very much. Uh, and we also, um, Maria, you'll help me with uh, who's on the phone. Okay. Let's see. I wasn't paying attention until I looked over here. So can we start with Leandra and go around? And uh, th sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. I'm really excited about all that's outlined here. You mentioned cultural confidence when you were talking about access to care, and it could be the word of the day. So wondering, and I haven't seen the report, but within your report, is that how you all, is it the term you used, or um, could there be uh, an update to oh, the day, right? Right. So oh. more focusing on cultural responsiveness, mm. the term confidence, I think okay. it would be helpful. And I don't know if you put that in the report or not, but if so, then so it's definitely it's helpful. It's okay. I don't yeah. I just think when we have a public facing document like that, it's just so important that we're Great. on our PCQs. Thank you. Appreciate your awesome work. Donna? Hasn't sat on and listened to some of the <laughs> this big idea report. The only other thing that I, I want to make sure is we've been talking about strengths, but also the uh, how we tend to view things and I, I kind of say the same thing. I know everything is person-centered, but for many of our cultural and ethnic groups, we're not person-centered as much as family-centered. We make decisions literally as a family for a person in collaboration with that person. So I, I want to make sure that as we um, continue writing our reports that we take that into, because sometimes you'll call and they'll say, well, I can only talk to the older adult. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've got to talk to all of us. When we go to home visits, you're going to see everybody. And Donna, can I just say, um, back way back in January, this graphic first came up. And I want to say AARP has donated the graphic support on this, so again, thank you. There was only the person in the yellow in the middle. Right. And Donna gave that feedback to the committee, and the committee took it back, and the graphic designer went and drew the circle of the circle. <laughs> they're growing. Uh, and again, recognizing it was, it's, it's that I, can, I don't want to speak your language, but family of choice, family, family can mean lots of things. But, you, but that's, the, that's Donna's circle of people <laughs> around. So that's the kind of example of the feedback cycle that's happening. Yeah. Okay, sorry, I cut the cue for Rita. So you're talking about the big idea rather than the low-hanging fruit. I think the dilemma that those of us who are experiencing the problems uh, are seeing, this is a 10-year process, but the people who we are taking care of cannot wait 10 years. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that it seems to me uh, like this training that you're going through in the department, 
not a suggested training for people to be culturally responsive, but a required by regulation training of people throughout the system uh, who are involved with LCSS from the board and care to the residential care facility to the LCA to the, uh, or the hospital setting kinds of things. Uh, we just, the problem for us is that we're often having to wait. I don't think that generating and requiring cultural responsiveness in this system can wait. Partly because if it doesn't start now, it won't be included in newly developed uh, curriculum that will be used for uh, enrolling people in service mm -hmm. to those people. It won't be used. It, it, it's like there is such a large, a widespread lack of cultural responsiveness now that if we don't start trying to, excuse me, mm -hmm. make people mm -hmm. be aware of their responsibility as a caregiving as part of a caregiving system. If that doesn't start now, it will it will continue to be one of the you know we're gonna it could be one of the last things mm -hmm. that gets implemented, and it will be a long time in coming for us. Mm -hmm. And that's you know including uh, people uh, from different racial minorities, LG. LGBTQ uh, groups, uh, you know, if, if you have to listen to somebody say that the person was rude to them because they found out that they were gay, but they're in the nursing home or they're in the assisted living uh, situation and there's no place for them to go, um, it's a really uh, distressing uh, experience for the whole family. So. My suggestion for the big idea to go after first is some required training and evaluation of people's cultural responsiveness. Mm. Uh, I just wanted to double down high risk, my field, on, on what we just said because you know there's the LGBT uh, senior long term care bill of rights uh, that was passed I think two years ago, um, and it's really hard to enforce. Mm, right, uh, and so uh, if, if 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 the workforce was required uh, to take their training, that would make a huge difference, and that would be both for for public and private workforce, right. uh, facilities and independent contractors. Yeah, and I, I, I just want to this is really good. I just want to uh, add one thing. If nothing else. It will help to prevent people from saying those insulting types of things yeah. that they say to folks, mm. caregivers uh, and the clients. Um, you know, I respect people's religious positions, but when you're working and getting paid to give a service, in my mind, you have already agreed that you will be more responsive. So um, people can keep their points of view and their biases. I just don't want to hear about them. Um, hi, so, I'm, just, I'm sorry. This is Valentine I, here. I I just wanted to support um, what's been said and just offer um, something up. Um, of course, my my teaching and background is in social work, and the term that we use now is cultural humility. Uh, rather than cultural competency, because it sort of puts the responsibility on the individual, and in this case, it would be the providers, to really, it's about self-reflection, looking at our own biases, looking and constantly examining our behavior towards others, and so I think that's just important to recognize. Thank you, Dr. Via. Sure. Edie. Yeah, I um, well, this is this is big work. I mean, you think about you think about 
engage in the work that we're doing, we're, we're talking about 50 plus, and that's three generations that we're looking at, trying to think about what fits three generations. I love this work because I get to shape things for when I'm going to be there, when I need these services. Um, so a couple things around cultural humility. I learned that term from Sylvia, so thank you. Um, and I, I think cultural humility, but also cultural relevance, which can mean a lot of different things in different communities, but really, rather than responsive, it's really relevant to your local community. Um, and just piggybacking on Valentine's comment, it really needs to happen at a policy and practice level. Right. Starting at who's designing it and who's then delivering the services that that's all in there. Um, the other two things I, that stand out for me are what I see are really big issues around LTSS is um, navigation. People have, we are service rich in many places and people do not know how to get to those services. So this idea of a care navigator uh, in different, whether it's a medical setting or nonprofit or library, I don't know, in many different settings, but really that is a big challenge for people. And the other one I think is probably the biggest challenge, whether it's culturally relevant or not, is the affordability. So when we look at Okay, we can refer someone to a social day program. It's a yeah. sliding scale, yeah. there might be scholarships, but you know, people wait and wait until to use services because they have not saved for this. Um, they didn't anticipate this. So I think the affordability piece is a really big one around LTSS. My last comment um, for now is around we're, we're trying to grapple with how do we talk about all of these different groups, whether it's racial and ethnic minorities or people of color. We want to include LGBTQ immigrants. What if we positioned it as underrepresented groups, but then somewhere quantify what we mean by that? I know it, it seems broad, but if everywhere we're saying, because racial and ethnic diverse communities include everyone. We are all representing a diverse community. So I don't know, I, I, I kind of like underrepresented communities where then, and we can stake a claim as to what we mean by that, but. Uh, let's see, Derek has, has his uh, card up and then Marty and Rigo. CCC and the services, uh, thank you for all the feedback, especially I think uh, Donna for calling out about changing the person center into family center, whatever we try to you know, define it because it's a very broad kind of uh, terminology. Uh, more so, I think it's very important to establish the leadership you know, at the very high level because uh, without that, it's really hard to trickle down to local level or to the different communities. I also wanted to point out that the workforce includes not only the paid or you know, family caregivers, we have a large volunteer workforce which we need to recognize. The reason I'm saying this is because uh, for all the various programs that we have, whether it's skilled nursing, assisted living, independent living, transportation, news on wheels, we have a very large uh, volunteer large, uh, workforce, uh, anyone to 1,000, mm -hmm. certain the people we are serving right now. So but I commend you know, the uh, MPSS uh, subcommittee for coming up with this uh, very robust plan, and I'm glad that uh, we are being invited to this table to further enhance, you know, how we can make it a better plan. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, in, in the, I want to ask you guys about what you think about the measures. In the health world, we often think about disparities and how to think about those in terms of uh, measures of care, for example, if I look at diabetes care or hypertension care at my health center, my board will often ask, okay, to break that down by different ethically diverse or racially diverse groups or gender diverse, whatever the definition might be, how are we doing and how do, how do those measures differ across those populations? Um, I'm sure in the LTSS area there's some things that 
you guys are wanting to look at. I know we have quality stuff referred to in the plan, but you know what? What are you thinking about how we get that kind of data just to understand how different subgroups are doing and how we might judge something like a nursing home complaint database, for example, and how that varies by certain subgroups? Uh, are we thinking of looking at that? You know, where does that fall? That's that look at data and outcomes uh, as we look at disparity. Yeah. It's negative, yes, but disparities in the in the LPSS world. Well, first of all, Susan and Sarah, it's been tremendous work. I commend you and, and the group and everything that you've been doing. And so, oh, can I get that back? Comment? Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, I know. But will, are, will you comment on that or just? How long do you want us to do it? Uh, sure. Let's talk about you want to have a response to the metrics question. That seems like the yeah. most logical. And do you want to take it or do you want to have research from uh, Carrie or Donna or Dr. Lincoln? <laughs> so Carrie Graham is our consultant who gets the staffing both LPSS and research subcommittee. So if anybody knows, it's Carrie. <laughs> uh, so uh, the research sub is definitely uh, looking at issues of equity. Every meeting that we've had, we've tried to lift up different groups, and as we actively try to uh, create this dashboard, um, we've been talking about data sources that, you know, what's the first thing you do? You make it so these issues aren't invisible. How do we track these groups, whether it's uh, by race, by gender, by sexual orientation? Um, and the other thing that's happening soon in terms of the cross-pollination efforts, which is we're just starting to get into this, is that the research subcommittee leaders on LPSS, which includes Donna and the other people, Kathy Kelly, Kathy, Catherine Keatsman, and um, Gretchen Alkama, are going to be coming to talk to the LPSS subcommittee on March 10th to talk about dashboard, as well as the other kind of goal of the research subcommittee, which is this data gap analysis and kind of a research agenda or an evaluation of the master plan. So I think that that's, you know, a, another leverage day where we'll discuss all these issues. And so we think the research subcommittee is coming to equity next time you guys meet. Great. We, we think. Great. That's what we, we'll talk about that. But that's our, we're trying to, this cross-pollination piece. <laughs> Rigo, you really are up. Sure, that's okay. <laughs> As I told Marty, that's an equitable request of you, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I think many of my comments have been addressed, but I did want to follow up, and I think you, you touched a little bit on this, and, and, and perhaps and when you talk about the domain of access to care, this is already implied, but I just want to make sure. Uh, one of the issues that I keep sort of raising as you know, so it, it, through the SAC conversations as well, when we've had model, you know, sort of plans come from the different plan of locations in throughout California, I often ask, well, these, these are you know great programs, but do um, mm -hmm. diverse communities, uh, underrepresented communities, are they aware of these programs? I mean, we're asking them to access, but access what? If you don't know what you know, what you need or where to go or what's available. So I think as you develop this plan, and, and, and forgive me if I, you know, you've addressed that, but, and so I look forward to hearing if you have. But if it hasn't, I think it needs to be because, like, how are you outreaching? Well, you know, I have yeah. some example I hear. Well, you know, we've reached out and we have, you know, we, we could see that we have communities of, you know, underrepresented communities within our services. Yeah, but those people are already there. How about those that are not there? How are you reaching them? And how are you measuring that change on based on and how do you know if you've done it successful? So sort of wanted to you know. uh, let's see. I want to have Catherine and Betsy and Tiara and a couple more and then we'll um, try to come to what our next step on this one is. So let's go back around. Catherine. Just pulling on two threads, we talked a little bit about the impact of an immigration climate um, earlier, I think, before we started this presentation. And, and I think that has a lot to do with how we need to think about addressing equities as, as by, by way of an example. And 
you know, the state has done a good job providing increased access to Medi-Cal, for example, for people whose immigration status um, would not otherwise make them eligible and funding that through a non-federal way. And I think us thinking through, like, how might that apply to other LTSS services to ensure that a community has access to something that they might otherwise be denied is, is an important thing that I don't think, I, until listening to this conversation, I really, like, thought through, and so we might want to just look back about that um, as one example of, of something that, that could be enhanced in the plan we're doing. Kiara. Well, one is just a comment, and one is just, and it's a, the other is a question. And we've been talking about a lot about language, whether it's racial and um, ethnic communities, the earth communities, and the represented communities. I'm just hoping we can all agree not to be minority communities. Yeah, so that's right. A misnomer at this point. Yeah. And um, my other comment is if we talk about equity, do we have the underrepresented groups defined that we're actually going to be trying to create parity for? Are they defined which, which populations we're talking about in the report, in the final master plan? Will they be outlined? Which population is in specific that we are referring to in terms of trying to create equity for? So the partial and I heard you on the first point about minority. We all think we've heard that. And the second piece is uh, yes and no. This is the language that, we, again, in this iterative process that was the equity, health and social due to age, disability, geography, income, race, ethnicity, immigration status, language, religion slash faith, sex, gender identity, sexual orientation, and family status. That's the current working. Okay. Let's see. Um, I just want to acknowledge the captioner needs a break. So are we going to give her a break? Okay. So uh, I'm going to... Somehow, um, we're going to have these comments, and then I'll the captain will come back. So if there are people on the phone who need access, we will address that on the fly. I'm trying to figure out how to do that, because we need to hear all the comments, and then maybe I'll try to get to the next steps in 10 minutes. So the captain is back so they can hear the action items and, and, and share that out so we're fully accessible. Um, Marcy. Um, earlier, you showed these wonderful graphs on um, uh, demographics, uh, which included uh, uh, underserved communities, uh, uh, primarily racial uh, mm -hmm. diversity, and, and, and the LGBTQ community was not represented. And so there is an urgency, and that urgency is the collection of data mm -hmm. at the state level. Uh, you know, we cannot create good policy and programs without good data. And it's, I know that I think it's several departments at the state level are supposed to be yeah. in the process of collecting data, but I haven't seen anything yet, and I know it's been a couple of years, and maybe we can speed that process along. The, the SOGI issue, yeah. Betsy. Hi, Betsy Butler. I, um, one underscore what Rigo was saying, and it's been something that has been a, a major concern of mine from when my father was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. They had, my mother had no idea what services existed, and so to, to have access to them is really, really important, but to not even know where to go, which I know the state's looking at, you got, you know, to be able to go one place and figure out what you have, um, it's a horrible learning process. Mm. Um, secondarily to that, when we talk about families and families of choice, I really want to point out the people who have nothing, who have no one, who are afraid to leave to talk about it, who are truly so isolated, who are so fearful, um, you know, how do we get to them? And I think a lot about the veteran population, because I've done a lot of veterans work, and just, they don't want to go out for benefits, they don't want to talk about it. And so anyway, the, the people who really are truly alone, how do you, how do you communicate with them? And I, I think very selfish in that in this considering I have no family, um, I have no kids, whatever, so it's all going to be my friends. So, but it's a very, it's a very, I, I get, we get so many calls about people who are just so isolated and have no idea where to go. And, and at that point, they're so desperate. It's just 
gone too, too far before the, the, they've gotten any services. So I just want to put them in the mix, too. Mm. Julia, and then, and then we'll check the phone. And Thank you. Thank you. Just to share some thoughts, I have like four points I'll try to do. I really appreciate the discussion around culture and control humility, cultural wholeness is another term. And I think that, you know, it's really like two themes, the social justice aspect that really has to do with systems change and with privilege and identifying the barriers, naming, disrupting, dismantling, that causes a lot of fear and, you know, emotional stuff. And, and it's an important conversation to have. And on the other side of culture, there's community development and cultural differences to recognize what's unique. And I think, and that's where the assets, that's why it's so important to do this mindset work so we can see the dignity in the people and not the poor people that have not. So anyway, and, and in terms of the community development is how to create alternatives also. So anyway, like one thing. The other one, I really appreciate also the conversation around and what we send to communities. And I like the, the in terms of, and I'm also really interested in language, the notion of voice. You know, what are the voices in the room and how can the perspective and the integrity of the person and the journey, their bodies, their trajectories, so, and, and to engage voices in assessing the need for programs. Because sometimes, you know, there are programs, but they are not meeting the needs of the people, even if people with Alzheimer's or whatever. So, so how to, as I say, engage the voices. And also appreciate that for some, you know, cultures, it's not person-centered so much, but it would include the family. And I would love to see the word intergenerational yeah. more. Yeah. Because really, a good, I also just, my, my father died two or three months ago, and my mother also, so I'm kind of coming out of that time for myself. And I like, you know, to think about the circle of care around the person, so not just the whole of the responsibility waiting on the shoulders of the closest relatives. So a circle of care, a community approach, and intergenerational, creating that. And, and then the last uh, comment, uh, I'm not very familiar with this, but when you were talking about workforce, I understand that you're talking about paid and not paid because it's really the care meeting. And there's a term that I don't know much about, but I like it, and it's caring labor. And caring labor has a political dimension because, you know, in, in current society, a lot of caring labor is like, oh, no, reproductive justice, and even just good health is taken for granted. You just show up to do the work that you get paid for. But so to bring, I mean, I'd, I'd be happy to do some research myself and, and, and share more about that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I would just echo that. And also kind of we've been talking a lot about like underserved communities. Um, but I think we should also be talking about inappropriately served communities mm. where uh, people who have, you know, first of all, know that they have access to services receive the service and actually get harmed by the service because it wasn't culturally or linguistically appropriate. Um, and then that also creates a trauma and then the person just never wants to return for any type of follow-up. Um, and I think one of the opportunities to kind of build that trust and rebuild those relationships um, is really deputizing and utilizing, you know, community health workers. I know one of the bullet points on the slide was like na navigators. And, and navigation and kind of like trying to rebuild kind of that trust um, in, in that these services, you know, are designed to, to provide that assistance. Um, and if there have been past traumas with interfacing with that system, um, really using community health workers to help kind of like mitigate that, I think it's really helpful too. Okay. Uh, I'm so grateful. This is exactly the conversation we wanted to have, even though we are, my mind is whirling about process. Uh, this is the content and the discussion and, and, the, and, the, and the challenge we needed. So um, what is going to happen next 
is that there are a group of people who are charged to bringing this back to the LTSS subcommittee, which is meeting again Wednesday to take the next step. Some of those people are Susan and Sarah and Lydia, who's on the phone, who are here from LTSS subcommittee. Catherine and Donna are on both here and LTSS. Carrie is the staff of LTSS who's here. Carmen is the staff whose equity is here. So those six people are going to figure out <laughs> how this conversation <laughs> gets taken back. And I think we've all been taking notes and we can think about who's writing it up. So I do feel like a document is needed. Well, that can be hard or a slide to summarize so much. But I do think it needs to be agendaized and reported back. And I would also, we never miss a chance to ask someone to volunteer to help. So if there are, if, I did not call your name, but you feel like you, you um, have in the next couple of days time to help us capture this or even review it uh, to make sure that we got it right, we would welcome that help. Um, and you don't have to have letters after your name, uh, LTSS or otherwise, to, uh, to, to provide us that help. So we're, those are people who already have that responsibility and we welcome others who could help us with this first practice of taking it back and reporting. And Kevin has a thought. Well, just that we did this very quickly and <laughs> without a lot of pre-information uh, for you all. So I wouldn't want to disclose opportunities, even though we're in a tight window here, to, yeah. to put something back out to the work group here with some opportunity to provide in writing further reaction um, based on, I think probably we can also do some improvement of the questions that we're forming into the tool and ask you to react to that. We didn't even get to like some basic questions. Some of you were able to say, here's some of the main issues we see in our community. Um, but maybe so that opportunity to provide some written feedback. Yes. To well, and this is another piece of this process. Um, if I'm, so there's one feedback loop, which is making sure this meeting, some part of this meeting is reported back on Wednesday. But then they also are going to share the next draft with everybody, let's say Tuesday. Tuesday. And they're going to let us have until Friday to comment on it? Let's say Friday. So all of us will have from Tuesday to something, a quick turn to see the document. Um, and that we will include the equity work group in that distribution and that clarity around timeline and how do you, what, who do you email with that. And then I think the question for Kevin and Rigo is right. Do you want to try to funnel equity work group comments and say, dear equity work group, we just got the draft from LTSS. They're talking about it tomorrow. Send any feedback to us by Friday. We'll get it. Do you, have, do you want to do that sprint next week? So just, I'll, I'll just ask that. <laughs> So we can think about that. I, I, I think it's, it's the question of bandwidth, right? But, right? but I think ideally it should go through this committee. I mean, right. Because uh, you'll, what we'll probably find is the, you know, lots of input, but common themes. And so then I think it would be our job to then identify those common themes and consolidate that so that then we can give that report. Yeah. Yeah. So let's see, let's see if we can map that in bandwidth and how much Carmen and Carrie we, I can all help because um, we, we are both trying to empower uh, stakeholders to do the work, but also not leave them out there to do the work. So it's that balance there. But I think those are the, at least the immediate two feedback loops is this conversation to the meeting Wednesday, when the draft comes out, a process they're consulting to get written feedback back to the committee. <laughs> we're talking, we're talking you're planning about how you're going to do it. I love it. It's happening right here. I want us to, um, I'm going to keep throwing things at you, just in the interest of I do want to have public comment time. Um, and I think uh, I'll make a proposal just if we have a straw proposal, and then people can tear it up. Um, what I'd like to do, so, is this. This slide is looking ahead. And, and just to be clear, Carmen and I will put our heads together with uh, Rigo and Kevin and Carmelita and summarize all this for you. Tomorrow we can do an email saying, here's the quick next step, just so we're all saying this. We're doing practice version of the LTSS feedback. Um, then the other thing I want to talk about is how you report, you guys report back to the staff on March 2nd. Give them an equity work group report. If we met, here's what we did. 
we practice with LPSS. Here's what we learned, but we'll do different next time. <laughs> then in March, we'd love to bring you the data dashboard template so you can start to see how the research subcommittee is looking at, uh, dare I say, person center objectives, key drivers, uh, breakdown by demographics or SOGI or gender. And again, so we'd like to have a research subcommittee and I think an engagement conversation, particularly around June 17th, which again is right around the corner from a community organizing perspective. Um, so maybe we could do that and then hold till late April, early May, these other three content areas, which are also massive, so that we have reports to give in May at the the staff, you might have noticed, has already decided we have to meet twice in May. This is too much coming at us. So they've already asked to double their days. So May is May 8th and May 18th to 28th. And then we'd like to meet one more time this summer. That's a straw proposal, and there's a lot of flexibility in with that. April, you could meet twice for a half day. April, we could say, oh, let's just do one whole day and power through. You could say, I don't want to meet in April. I want to meet first week in May, right before the May revise comes out. Uh, so I think we're open, but maybe we can get a couple minutes of feedback on is it better to meet for a half day every month and just get in a cadence? Is it better to let some more work develop? Um, we're really open, I guess, unless you all have strong feelings about what, yeah, nobody seems to have a strong feeling, so we're hoping somebody here does. <laughs> I have a question. Yes. So uh, I heard you uh, mention the May revise. So one of the questions is, is anything that we're talking about going to uh, show up in the May revise? Mm, that is the question. Yes. So if, that, if it, there's any possibility of that, although I know the May revise is probably almost already finished, <laughs> uh, given the way the system works, that um, I would rather see us meet again in April. Yeah. Uh, my translation of the executive order with the only thing due in March is LTSS, mm -hmm. is that LTSS that's is most sure. ripe for uh, that tea leave reading. So that's why I think this March 2nd, what is the LTSS priorities, is on such a fast track. Okay. Um, which isn't to say there aren't many other things that are urgent. So right. sooner is better, but we are really in it for the long haul, the 10 year plan, too. If you have any reactions or thoughts, otherwise we will go away and come back with a proposal. But if you have thoughts about less is more, half full. Did this, how did this feel today? Is this, did, to me, this ended up feeling a little bit short. Do we yeah. think we generally need just a longer time together because it takes a little while to get into the space? If we're making the travel to here, let's yeah. spend a little bit more time yeah. together. Yeah. And I would love to have more to um, respond to yeah. and to yeah. digest. Yeah. yeah. I am done. <laughs> <laughs> but you can pass the next year, yeah. Oh, okay. Edie's, oh, well, you can hear me either, but. I would, I would prefer a, lo a longer well, time together. Uh, and it, it feels like today is sort of like catch up. Yeah. yeah. So that once we have a little bit longer time, we can really dig down a little deeper and, and really get, maybe get ahead of it, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, this is Rita Sainz. I'm assuming that we, because of the changes that needed to be made in the LTSS document, we obviously you know, didn't have it to look at it in advance, although many of us have seen portions of it or all of it. Um, are we assuming that we will have documents in advance? Great question, Rita. Great question. So the, uh, I was asking for the, the next, the March, Carrie, um, just we're going we're gonna to affirm that there, the research committee could bring a data dashboard template to this group to look at. They could look at both the actual template tool that the research subcommittee, as well as maybe the CDPH Let's Get Healthy California dashboard, which is what we're thinking is the model for the design of this. So there, there are things. The question was, we'd like to see things in advance, have the materials ready to review before we meet again, which is beyond valid. Uh, so we want to make sure the March meeting is scheduled when there is enough data dashboard research committee feedback to review. And then there'll certainly be enough June planning. If, uh, we, we have to get that. The first planning call on that is next week. So that'll be ready in March. The thing that's tricky for me, and this is Jennifer, Jennifer Ram, because she has livable community health and well-being, economic security and safety. And so the later in April, the earlier in May we make that one, the more robust that'll be. Right? Your work group will have your, looking at Marty, 
your work group on health and well-being will have recommendations by late eight. I mean, two months from now, there'll be there'll be some uh, real substance there. And not 40 pages. <laughs> You heard it here first, not 40 pages on health and well-being. You can get a hold of to it, all right? Um, and I think Nina can say that by late April, two months from now, she'll have livable communities and purpose coming together with Jenny Chin Hansen. And Kevin, you've already gotten started, I'm sure, on economic security. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Done. Done. So as soon as they're ready, we're ready. So that's the question on that one, is how late do we push it to be late enough that they have some for you to react to, but not so late that it's done. Well, yeah, I don't think we have to worry about the latter. <laughs> uh, I think that's just a commitment we should make, that the schedule we plan should be that there's substantive things to react to. Okay. Yeah. And we've got two of the three captains here, so we'll just, we'll just pin Nina down. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's sounding like a longer meeting in March to do data research. Mm -hmm. and, and we're not even presenting the data dashboard to staff till May. Oh, right. So I think it's a template. It's a template, though, right? Because oh, okay. you're having four research subcommittee meetings and you're having a template. So this, this folks can look at the template and say, that's not, I can give advice on that. Um, also on the LTSS, uh, the results. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay, so we want to make sure that we bring you back, we have enough to react to. So yeah, let's. May. But well, we will work on a March date and agenda, recognizing also we're now going to say late March, right, because it's already a month out from mid-March, so we need to give you time to block days and all that. And then late April, here we go. So in addition to that, I know I'm, I'm going to add a little complexity. Oh, good. But I think also in terms of why we're going to meet the purpose, um, I also think we should use it to come back yes. at, at the next session as, with a report back from LTSS. We want to see, you know, how this – you know, how that was, uh, the input from here was integrated That's into right. the report. That's right. That's absolutely right. So I okay. think we need to add that to our conversation okay. as well. Okay. And the discussion for the June 17th statewide event is also planned for then? Well, I'd like to get your input right as we start that one. So, I mean, that's the other thing we could do is um, we could have a webinar conversation about just that in mm -hmm. very soon um, and then save the, the LTSS and research for later into March, or we could just bring you here for a week in April. <laughs> Eagle, do you work at your <laughs> Don't let my board hear you. <laughs> okay, so we're hearing, okay, yeah, but you want, the, the goals are you want to have real things to respond to, and you want to have enough time to come up here. Uh, you want to see what you did before. Okay, these are things we can use to drill down and get these dates and these agendas and these times blocked. Do you have, unless you have a solution, Edie. Oh, shoot. <laughs> I, I, I have a quick question, though. June 17th, did you choose that because it's after the budget, per se, not before it's been signed, but, you know? Trying to, yeah, clear a little space for people and find a clear Wednesday. And then before July, much late, everyone goes. So I'm just saying, do you want to focus, okay. Well, so do you want to focus on that at the meeting, the budget, and what's happening? Or is there much going to be in it, I guess, maybe? This is Every meeting. The budget is the budget. Oh, you mean going to affect? Base. Yeah. Is it is any is there good stuff in it that somehow would impact the work we're doing right now, or is it like another year away? So? At the at May oh, we're, yeah. We're going to have the May revise on May 10th probably, right? So the question for me, if if I'm, and if we're aligned on this, is do we want to see what happens, if anything, having to do with MPA? in the budget right. and have a discussion about it. Yeah. What is the gov government so moving on now? Yeah, so it's like if it's about our TSS. There has not yet been a lot of coordination between what's happening at the MPA and the current legislative and budget cycle okay. because there's just so much that the uh, SAC is wrapping its arms around. Okay. So I, I'm sure, okay. I'm pretty sure okay. that you weren't looking at that date strategically related to the budget cycle, but rather just strategic of the calendar. Um, so there might be some stuff, but it won't be that strategic. Right. I mean, best case scenario is there's something to celebrate, <laughs> but that's not what we're planning it around. Okay, yeah. yeah. Right. We'll count on it. See you early. We can't wait, says Rita. That's right. Yeah. I mean, there's something. We maybe really can't wait. Not looking at, you know, how the May Revive is going to impact the work we do here, but maybe how the May Revive impact our presence here, because many of us that's are. Where, that's where I was going. Yeah. So we'll, we'll be yeah. busy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have about uh, my you 
and I will compare. I have about 15 next steps caught, but uh, before we do that, I do want to give a chance for public comment from people in the room and on the phone. Um, first of all, let me turn to you. Does anybody on the phone have their hand up? You can ask them. Anyone in the room like to make a comment on any or all or questions? This is hard to figure out how she's going to bring the template. <laughs> <laughs> Did we have a lot of people on the webinar? We've had about uh, 25 people on the webinar. Good. Okay. So good turnout. Uh, not public comment. Should we take a crack? Maybe, at, uh, just a 90 minutes. Go ahead. Um, well, oh, oh good. Okay. I think that's actually sure. a pretty good show <laughs> to the meeting. Okay, this one is from Bill. Uh, Five or three? Yep. Yeah, I don't know. Let's have a how many people this is. Yeah, this is. Okay, Bill, you're unmuted, it sounds like. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to say uh, thank you, everybody there, putting this together. Uh, it's a long, hard conversation to do equity. So I'm thanking you for all your efforts in advance. Thank you. And Bill is, uh, I recognize the name from a frequent webinar Wednesday uh, participant. So thank you for being so actively engaged. Yeah. Good. Okay. With, yeah, yeah. Oh, should we go here, Carmen, or you're giving me the. Well, um, I was going to say we can just refer, um, just let people know we also have additional. We, uh, we also have additional handouts on the, um, on the website that have to do with equity tools and Rigo um, and Kevin referred to them earlier but just in us asking these equity questions we're also trying to create a tool that we can use to apply to um, all things master plan for aging so we're we're keeping that in mind while you ask these questions because they're going to help us develop that tool so I think it's going to be it sounds like a funnel where we're, we're taking all these questions and then it's going to translate into a tool. Right. Yeah. Yes. That's another step in the process that we have to take. This is going to be another step in the process. Yeah. You look, listen up. Here's one of my summary now of all these next steps that, that we are taking. Okay. Um, okay. So all the materials that were shared will be posted updates okay everything is going to be posted um, per usual and it lives you hopefully you can find it through the engage website of course on the agency website the equity work group page is up members are listed etc we are Carmen is going to be revising the purpose statement based on and the I should just say the five of us are kind of the planning crew for these um, never miss a chance to ask someone else to volunteer but we have pre planning calls and post planning calls to revise the purpose work on the tool a fair amount. I think we got a lot of really great feedback on the tool. I would ask if you have resources like the events, the Cantonese language event, please share that and we'll share that back out in our follow-up email. We're happy to do that. Um, we are going to work on a March, April, and June meeting agenda and scheduling and length and location. Uh, we love feedback on this location. The good thing about it is it's always here and it has parking. I think you're experiencing the challenges with it, the uh, AV uh, and the wireless, and there's other, and public transit is not good here, so there's, there's pros and cons of this room, so we're open to feedback on that. Um, we will go back to the funders, some of the issues that were raised here about possible resources being needed, that conversation, um, Sarah and I can take that back. We will finish our um, selection round two. We need to finish that and bring our new members um, to the table. Uh, we will work on the LPSS feedback for their meeting Wednesday, and then the written document that comes out Tuesday process through you all. We'll figure out what's, what's possible bandwidth. Um, I also want you all to, we, we, to, and I'm thinking also about other webinars and other things, but before we, like, just think about what else. We, we covered a lot. We didn't even finish everything we wanted to do today. We've got a lot to do, but uh, just there's so much opportunity to use equity in all that we're doing. So uh, don't hesitate to, to keep dreaming and thinking of other things to put on our list. Um, what else was on action steps? <laughs> Next 
steps. You'll hear from Carmen kind of with a quick next step, and then they'll be in progress. She's your main point of contact. Yeah. Well, listen in on Wednesdays. We're covering goals two, three, and four, which we're not talking about today. And we yeah. have for you all to listen in. Yeah, good PSA. This one coming up is Emergency Preparedness and Disaster, featuring uh, uh, Sonoma County and other experts and independent living centers. And isolation is right behind yeah. isolation and inclusion and featuring our very only Andre Harvey. Yeah. Uh, so equity lens going into all of those, so we would also love your support there. Yeah, you know, we should bring that to the next meeting too. That's a great idea. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Take that too. Uh -huh. And I would say come to the research meeting. Come to the research meeting then as our guest uh, and and get input on how you want to see equity lifted up in the dashboard and the data gap analysis. And the research meetings, so all, the, all those meetings are calendared publicly again on our webpage. But I want to give a special shout out to the research meetings. They are on the show is on the show is on the road. They went to UC Berkeley, and then in February we're going to Stanford. Laura Carstensen is hosting the research subcommittee. In March we're going to West Health. We're going to spend the morning tour, touring geriatric ER. Do I have that right? And then go back to West Health for the meeting. And then are you hosting? Donna. Donna's hosting. <laughs> Not Donna. <laughs> Dr. Ben. The Leonard Davis School of Gerontology. Yes. Thank you very much. It's hosting in April. Uh, so it's both a chance to um, be at one of the world's leading research institutions with our research subcommittee, which is packed with leading researchers, uh, and, see, and see what's happening with the dashboard, see where the data gaps are, and also see some groundbreaking research in amazing settings. So that's, we would love to welcome people there. I don't know where we're going to be in May. I won't even try. That was as far as I can get. We're presenting this back in May. Okay, we'll be here. Yeah, Kevin. I would also say that there's just so many meetings. I think on on the equity issues in particular, don't wait for the right opportunity or the right question to be posed to bring the idea. We're working to do that, but also I think like as our conversation today, um, just the. I, any ideas that are getting lobbed in, I think I'm, I'm worried about blind spots we have in this space. And so the question might not ever get framed properly or the right meeting might not happen. So please don't wait for that. Feel free to speak out of, even if it feels out of turn, uh, whether it's directly to CDA or to Rigo or I or Carmelita um, or any of your colleagues. Like I think we just need to get the ideas collected, especially that'll help give us a little bit of guidance. Similar thing, if there's one piece that's your thing that you're an expert on and you say, you know, you want to really hang on to, let us know that so we can say, okay, it's this webinar, it's this committee, it's this, and we can kind of give you the, um, the direct path on that issue. I know we're trying to be transparent, but sometimes I know now we have so much going on, it's overwhelming. Yeah, yeah. Derek. Yes. Since we talk about uh, workforce, and I know that the research committee is planning to go to Berkeley. Went to Berkeley already and go to Stanford and USC and West Health. What about UC Davis School of Nursing? Yep, that's it. They have a very robust uh, program. They have a lab actually will train a future workforce you know, on how to take care of seniors and that's a really yeah, that's that. essential component mm -hmm. in the whole mm -hmm. game plan. And we have Helen Young who actually yes, formed the yeah. School of Nursing, right? Yep. So, she presented at our research. She did. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We haven't. We might. We might ask her to host for the next one. You yeah, I would recommend like you go and visit it. It's amazing. amazing. Yeah. Yes. yes. Yeah. They're hosting the um, one-year anniversary of the future of the Workforce Commission coming up. So yeah, they're great. Let me, um, are there any other uh, operational next steps to capture? Is there something you want to be sure happens or? Oh, Donna, and then the other? Yes, sir. ASA is in March, and I, you had mentioned late March, but isn't that ASA? Yeah, we're all going, or many of us right. are going to. Yeah, so just remember. ASA is American Society on Aging, and a lot of people have, might be participating. We're going to a meeting there in, uh, <laughs> in Atlanta. <laughs> okay. Yes. Good. Thank you for that reminder. That week is out. So in terms of what would be the next steps in terms of those two, two issues, hi, thank you, that we identified as urgent. One was mandating cultural competency and the other was uh, uh, moving forward the sexual orientation and gender identity data collection by the, by the state. I think the LTSS committee heard it and we'll take it back to the LTS committee for inclusion and report. That's what I took as the next step okay. from that. Right, thank you. And that's what I think we need to document is this is these are the things that were recommended to go to the LTSS report and then um, 
they will have their draft on Tuesday that may or I'm, this, this is the, the squishy part. Will them hearing it today get it in over the weekend before Tuesday, or will it the draft Tuesday not have it and having the feedback there mean it gets in by Friday? Well, wow. and uh, you know, a lot of the work we're doing here is around re informing reports and plans, but spinoff of the work here can be advocacy that happens through other venues to get yes. items yeah. to happen more quickly. Right. So, you know, to the extent that we're identifying those things, you know, the kind of the work that, that Kim is leading us all through here is, is to, to feed CDA. Right. So we can be partnering on items through the current legislative cycle or budget cycle or administrative opportunities. So, you know, those, those ideas should be on the table, but we need to know they're on a different track to move them. Thank you. Rita's jumping up and down. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I, I see other people have their thing up here. I, I, I want to go back on something that I was saying about uh, training people. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, this is Rita Simon. I wanted to say something about uh, the mandating or the regulating of training. I think it should be accompanied by some incentive. You know, uh, uh, when I say, I guess I was a little thinking about some things that got a little irritated there. <laughs> Uh, uh, people choosing to do this or choosing to do that, but I really do think that um, the state needs to look at uh, incentives for the people they're paying for doing the work. You know, if, if it becomes a part of the claim process, mm. or people are allowed to claim for getting people trained, then it will be done. And as, as <laughs> we all know, who are have been in the claim business with the state. If it, you can't claim it, you don't do it. So yeah, some sort of uh, thoughtful incentive, CDU, something like that, I think should be included. So. And to, to, to your point, Kevin made it, you know, there's the master plan, getting in the master plan process, there's the getting it in bill and budget, and then is there something CDA as a program leader could do right now? We would love to know. Do you have time to do anything? <laughs> <laughs> we, can, we can host a webinar. <laughs> no, but I mean seriously, if there's if this is if there's a yeah, important okay. work. Yeah, it's important. We have to. Yeah, make time. Yeah. Um, right answer. Right. Yeah. But we need help to know what that is. <laughs> yeah. Right. So that, right. Right. Let me think. Let me think on it. Yeah. yeah. You can also ask us to do things just to straight up CDA. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Kim, I would like to add to what we did in session to bring our member in the uh, webinar on work opportunities for older adults and persons with disabilities. One of the recommendations that came out, you know, from reading all those, you know, comments and <laughs> right, yeah. was to basically ask the state to develop a legislation that would trickle down to local and private entities and ask them to employ older adults and persons with disabilities mm -hmm. with the notion that there are some incentives because without incentives, why would, you know, mm -hmm. someone do it, mm -hmm. right? So we need to incentivize them to do mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Jeffrey, is Rita, are you, Rita, are you up oh. again? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Jeff. Um, one of the um, initiatives I want to highlight of uh, Doodle Health, um, which is a partnership with Hydro for Men at SEIU, they, uh, they're, they're um, starting to recruit for their first class of students, and their goal is to train something like 10,000 um, allied health professionals by 2024. One of their priority areas is the aging population, so having some type of um, maybe a webinar, yeah. you know, having conversations with them might be fruitful. Yeah. What's that? Doodle Health, Future Health. Uh, this is Linda with the pen. Um, just to echo um, Rita's comments about like the training and like the importance of that, um, I would also ask us to look like very closely at like the quality of the training, um, and that we would really advocate for an in-person cultural humility training. Because I know there's a lot of kind of like web-based trainings where you can like literally just like let the video roll and go walk your dog and then come back and complete it. <laughs> they want to make sure that it's really like meaningful and like people are actually engaged and like getting like really um, good content out of it and not just doing it because it's required. So yeah, just whatever that tool is or whatever best practices that are out there, um, we just don't want to 
say they have to do training and they find, you know, whatever. Yeah. Uh, I love this conversation. Last year when we rolled out the CalFresh expansion to um, people with SSI, we did a series of webinars on the rules, you know, how to calculate benefits and how to calculate income with my policy expert. But we also did a series on how to serve older adults, uh, and older adults who are LGBTQ, older adults who are immigrants, um, and we had local people. And it, I don't know how many, you know, hundreds of people heard, and it wasn't required, and it was a webinar. But it set a cultural expectation, I think. It set a norm from that the state said you will, you will be serving diverse populations and we expect you to do it well. So it's not the same as a requirement. But I do think there are ways that even with the limited levers we might have, we could normalize and uh, get to where what you're talking about, in-person, high-quality, required, and ongoing, there's, you know, the gold standard. But there's ways to start, too. And, and the other thing is working with consumer affairs and the licensing Okay. Absolutely. There, that's something that should happen. Absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Put your stamps up. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting used to this. Um, so one thing, and I also want to echo um, what Kevin is saying is we want feedback as much as possible. Um, also, Kim, we're, you know, this is a, a process that is continuing. We're doing about a million things at the same time. So just for a warning, we're, you're not always going to have, we would love to look at a complete report of, for those who are drafting different things and you're saying it's not ready to show you yet, equity work group, so we don't want to give it to you right now. Don't worry about that because we, you've looked at it, so I think we need to look at it with our lens. So we don't want to look at finished products and then you haven't considered what we're thinking about in the equity work group. We, um, just like the LCSS, that was great. We had a whole 30 to 45 minute robust conversation on a shell that's still forming. I think it was good timing. You know, some people say, no, it wasn't good timing because wait, it's gonna come out on Tuesday. But no, it's transition. So we, we were able to get that feedback in right now, which is, which is great. So, and just a funny look behind the behind the curtain. Um, I I haven't seen it, uh, and I'm, my my call is with them tomorrow to give them my feedback based on that shell. So you're ahead of me. You, this is how it is. Like we are just in it, so, looking at the shells, responding. So you know, right on time. Yeah. As you should be, I should say. So do we want to? Um, I'd love to do a time. We are kind of already moving into open mic. <laughs> if there are people who'd like to do either um, any comments on what could be better next time uh, and what worked this time, we would love to take that back for continuous improvement. Mm -hmm. Just logistical thing. Um, I'm sorry, I just thing. If we aren't going to have access to, because I had everything on my uh, online ready to pull up, but we didn't have access. The Wi Fi did not work. And, no. And um, my uh, hotspot, unfortunately, wasn't working. So it would be nice that we have some backup yep. physical copies. There weren't enough. I think some people might have received them. Yep. If we're going to continue yep. to take care. Yeah, Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. That's great. I mean, it's oh, you said you were getting the microphone. When's that <laughs> happening? Come on, get out. Right. <laughs> Miracles happen. We're moving. It's the actual solution. Well, in a year from now, we'll be in Gateway Oaks. So we're in this, like, process of... How much do we fix this and how much do we stagger out of here? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. Done and done. <laughs> yeah. Others. Oh, Edie and Betsy. You're getting a lot of steps in. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just want to thank, thank you and thank the whole group for this um, very open process. I thought it was great and that we don't have stuff finalized, but that's good. And, and just the openness of the whole group and the process, I really have appreciated it. So I'm really looking forward to more meetings. Thank you. I just, I want to say thank you too. I, I am so appreciative of Kim and your responsiveness and just everything about you. So thank you for that. And I, the thing that I really loved about the um, statement of purpose is that the board evaluation is in there. And I don't know if you remember I had this conversation with you a while ago. Like you can't put in new programs and then not evaluate them and continuously evaluate them and think that, especially when you're creating huge wholesale changes, you can't implement something.
and think that this can work for everyone. That's all going to be fine. We're going to have um, Wi-Fi service. Yeah. Um, uh, so I, you know, I, I, I thank you for for all of your openness and all of your inclusion and all that, um, Tim. I really do. And um, I was going to add implicit bias training. I should have said that. That that should, you know, we do that with our judges and with our law enforcement. Again, though, we need to evaluate that because it doesn't always work out so well and doesn't seem to stick. But um, <laughs> and by, uh, implicit bias training, very very important too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I think for for you Tim, and for all the staff that it's important for you to know that the people who are involved in this process appreciate how complicated it is, yeah. how complex it is, how um, getting stakeholder input at this type of a level consistently as you've been doing is really, in my experience, having worked with, uh, with the state, uh, extraordinary. Um, and the good thing about it is that you wanted to do it rather than waiting for people to knock on the door and insist that you do it. So that's, we. I think, I can speak for everybody here that that's always reassuring. Okay. Uh, I really want to thank um, any whoever put together the reading materials and the references. I got to go through those, and I would like maybe in our next meeting if we could talk about the inclusivity. Because I, when I read through about like how do we define inclusivity and how is that, I think that's going to be important for the dashboard a little, and also for other things. Because I, I just there one statement said um, we can get people to in the same area, but who's going to invite them? If you get them to the dance, who's going to actually dance with them? And that statement in there just like went, yes, that's the you know what we need to understand. And I know we didn't get to that discussion, but I would like to see that next time. Okay, Carmelita, yes. <laughs> um, I just wanted to thank all of you for staying engaged. I know we threw a lot at you, and uh, we were shooting from the hip, or we were all shooting from the hip every now and then, but. You all are examples of what, how we want this group to operate, to bring your best thinking, and to get to know each other as well. I mean, it seems like you all do kind of know each other. Remember Donna from way back when and all that? Yeah, but, that old, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a way in which we also need to, to be comfortable with each other as we go through forward with this work. And one of the the, the Suggestions on mitigating uh, unconscious bias is get to know people outside of your comfort level. And maybe we just start with ourselves so that we can work really together and, and making this work for all of us. It's, it's, it's really important work. In my head, <laughs> my brain is just so full of stuff right now. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I echo what Kevin says in terms of if anything comes to you in the middle of the night, you know, jot it down and give us a call or send it to Carmen, poor Carmen. But like me, maybe, um, things come to me later. Mm -hmm. I think about everything that's been said here, and then all of a sudden I go, what up? You know, I should have said that, or I should have been thinking that. And it doesn't come easy sometimes. Yeah. So thank you. Yes, and I'm getting a lot of credit here, but we would not be here if it wasn't for Carmen doing the work. Yeah. So uh, let's end with a big thank you to Carmen. Right. And we, well, you'll be hearing from Carmen. <laughs> <laughs> we get emails from Carmen at 7 in the morning. Yes, oh, thank you all. More to come. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Bye -bye. Oh, God. <laughs>